Hi there, this is Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot and we are going live on live stream with Bill Brockbrader and Eva Moore. In the background is a song that someone has written. Bill, do you want to give that person any kind of uh, attribute or anything? Uh, yeah, let me uh, pull that up. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Craig Bashirs uh, for creating that song. Uh, he uh, sent that to me today, and I listened to the words, and I absolutely love what it says, so thank you, Craig. Great. Okay. What's going on is is that we are going to be doing a second follow-up interview here with Bill Brockbrader, a.k.a. Bill Wood. Um, he came out under an assumed name initially to protect himself and his, uh, well, close family, etc. And uh, he knew that eventually he would be discovered on the internet, as, as sure enough did happen, but it gave him a little leeway in the, in the beginning, um, sort of, as it happened, he needed that leeway, um, and he's going to explain why. At this mo moment, I'm going to just let Bill Brockbrader go ahead. Uh, the first thing we're going to address is um, the questions from the Navy SEALs in regard to his training, and uh, he's going to say whatever he is allowed to say or whatever he feels comfortable saying that keeps him um, safe and, and keeps him within his classified status uh, without breaking that, I guess. So go ahead, Bill. Um, the first thing uh, that I need to say about all the questions that are coming out from the Navy SEALs and all the uh, answers that they want as far as my training background and what I've done is that they understand that they are bound by the same confidentiality agreement that they signed that I signed. And to explain to the layman what a confidentiality agreement is, is if you uh, discuss any uh, classified or top secret information that uh, you acquired in your time in service, uh, uh, the description that I've been given is that they will throw you in a hole and then they, were th they will throw away the hole. And uh, I think everybody understands that those prisons do exist, that there are some prisoners in this country that nobody knows about and they are in these places, that, these prisons, that don't exist. Um, I desperately do not want to get put in one, um, so I will abstain from being led into the trap that the Navy SEALs want me to discuss and uh, reveal my training and background and uh, what I have done in my time of service. And uh, I do apologize for that, but there is uh, some security issues that uh, I have been dealing with lately that are very, very real. Um, certainly, I could uh, point to the fact that uh, my true identity uh, was found and outed almost immediately after the interview. Um, Carrie can speak to uh, some uh, people that uh, have uh, directly gone after her and me very openly. Uh, one of which is a former Navy SEAL that uh, runs a very uh, informational website and uh, obviously he spends a lot of time and effort on, but uh, I believe it also uh, indicates that he does have some uh, government ties and he is involved in the information or disinformation game about uh, Navy SEALs and keeping their uh, secrets a secret. Uh, there was also uh, another gentleman that uh, is involved in a very, uh, obviously, high-powered, uh, I would call it a private investigations company, but it also appears to be a very special investigations company. And uh, those two gentlemen uh, have been making Kerry and uh, my life miserable. And uh, that is the primary reason why the information has come out. Now, since uh, the Navy SEALs have asked me some questions, I would like to ask them two questions. And maybe this would help people understand uh, what's really going on in the world right now. Um, Senior Chief Shipley, Don Shipley, is the former Navy SEAL that's uh, been going after me. 
he's uh, been making some very broad statements on the internet and calling me a liar and uh, saying that SEAL Team 9 doesn't exist. Um, and uh, he's been providing a lot of information that I would challenge as how would he know. Um, certainly, I don't think Senior Chief Shipley has access to every black project ever created in the military, every secret uh, uh, military team ever created in the military. So I'm going to ask Senior Chief Shipley this one thing. If he could address this, then um, I think everybody will completely understand where I'm coming from. Um, if SEAL Team 9 doesn't exist, why doesn't it exist? Why did they skip the number nine when they created SEAL teams? Um, everybody's very well aware that up until very recently, like last year, end of last year, SEAL Team 6 didn't exist either. And the same information would have come out. Deny, deny, deny. Everybody would have said SEAL Team 6 doesn't exist. And, you know, these guys are a bunch of liars if they say it does. But we found out different. Over time, the truth came out. Uh, they use that information to uh, create a nice little publicity campaign and, you know, tout that we killed Osama bin Laden, yay America. Um, but I don't think America or in our government has a very good track record of telling us the truth. And that's what we're really trying to talk about today, is the truth. Um, certainly there's mountains of information from uh, what I call the Department of Disinformation, and they are working feverishly. A uh, few hours uh, after I woke up this morning, I was getting dozens of emails asking why the show had been canceled. I didn't know why the show had been canceled, but information has been put out there that the show was canceled, and I found that very interesting. It's, and I know Carrie will back me up on this, there has been a massive amount of pressure on her to not let this show go through. And she has been doggedly determined to make sure it happens. So we need to uh, thank Carrie for putting her butt on the line just as much as I'm putting my butt on the line. For so years. Carrie, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I would thank also you. like to ask uh, one more question to the SEAL teams. And uh, everybody that uh, is uh, not in the military or still in the military, there is no such thing as an ex-Navy SEAL. You are always an ex, you are always a Navy SEAL if you are a Navy SEAL. Um, my question is, why aren't you guys doing what I'm doing? Why is it up to me? Why aren't you obeying your oaths? You swore to protect and defend this Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies foreign and domestic, just as I did. Nobody will deny we both took that oath. So why is, is it up to Republic? me? Why is it up to me? Why aren't you guys stepping up? Why aren't you doing your jobs? If you're the true Navy SEALs, why is it the fake Navy SEAL, according to you, is doing all the hard work <laughs> and standing up and being a leader and trying to help people understand the truth about this country? Because I know all of you have information that this country needs to understand that there's things going on that the average citizen has no idea about the war effort and what we do to create war, what we do to create terrorism. National security is a threat because we create the threat and every one of you knows it. And every one of you could stand up and say something that supported my message and fix this country and you haven't done it. So answer those two questions. Why no SEAL Team 9, and why aren't you helping fix this country? Because you know it's broken. Thank you, Perry. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, I appreciate that statement uh, very much. And I, I agree, we have been a, uh, under a lot of pressure. Um, in fact, I have uh, uh, gotten in touch with a lawyer to, to give me some guidance in terms of, because I am an investigative journalist and I needed to know what my rights are under these circumstances. Um, tonight during this broadcast, Bill Brock Rader, aka Bill Wood, may say some things or name some names that I am not um, 
aware of, you know, in advance, uh, as as did happen in the interview, simply because that's not how we operate. I do do not vet the information before we release it. This is a live broadcast in which I will ask questions. Uh, Bill will present some some material, some evidence, and he will send you to some links that have evidence posted uh, as well. Um, Project Camelot is protected legally from um, from s certain uh, issues simply because of the way we've decided to to do this broadcast. So I just want people to to understand that we do not wish to be embroiled in um, sort of legal legalese and spend our time uh, defending a, a bunch of nonsense um, in court, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, that's just a waste of our energy. So, so we want to want to focus on the ball, so to speak, here in 2012, and we'd like to to move along. But with that said, uh, we do want Bill to bring forward as much evidence as he can muster and and direct your attention to that evidence in whatever way he sees fit during this broadcast. So, uh, Bill, at this point, uh, I I know that. There are many, many questions still in the audience, and I am I'm getting you know a live stream chat. We have uh, Tommy, my webmaster, who's going to be helping behind the scenes to gather up the questions. Uh, hopefully, those questions will go into caps, and also if um, if anyone can assist him to gather them onto one uh, Skype, and then Tommy can Skype them over to me. That that would be great because it it becomes very difficult to watch the stream go by when we have so many uh, listeners, live listeners, as you can appreciate. Um, um, can, real quick, if I could ask, um, have you uh, put the link up on chat for the reference materials that I'm going to be uh, giving out to people? Okay, um, Tommy would have put that on the uh, on the page which is at uh, projectcamelot.tv but uh, I, he will, he's listening to this and so I will ask him to do so. So Tommy, if you could please uh, post that link into the chat for people. Um, I believe it's also been posted, I think, on the forums. So I believe it's on Avalon and Camelot forums for, for people that, uh, that, that would like to get to the evidence right away, but you will be able to see it after this broadcast as well. After this mm -hmm. broadcast, this will be continue to be live streamed, as all our broadcasts are. Uh, it will also be downloaded and put up to YouTube as quickly as we can manage it, so be patient. Um, and it will continue to be free uh, to anyone and everyone. We are asking for donations. This is uh, takes a lot of time for us to get one of these things together. We have uh, people like our, my webmaster working behind the scenes. Um, he's using an old computer. We need to buy him a new one. Anyone who can help us uh, in these ways, we, we do appreciate it. Um, so at this point, I, I do want to say this broadcast was never in in um, uh, danger of being canceled in any way. That was a disinfo campaign. Uh, we tweeted in live and um, Facebooked immediately uh, to let people know that that was was a fake um, sort of attack on us. At this time, our servers are being attacked. So um, so I'm going to ask people to be patient with Project Camelot TV. Uh, if you have friends that want to listen, they should be mm -hmm. clicking on the direct live stream link to get here uh, if they're having trouble because they are attacking our servers in force at this time. And Tommy's, as always, doing an incredible job. Um, so thank you, Tommy. Uh, go right ahead, Bill. I would like you to, to, to move forward in the, in the direction you would like to at this moment. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, start off by talking about the uh, donations um, because I been, uh, well, I've had questions about the, uh, the $1 donation that I've been asking for. So uh, let me give you a little bit more information about that. Um, what that uh, has been doing is allowing me to uh, find the people throughout the world, I might add, um, that are interested in helping the people that want to do some good in the world, that are ready to stand up and do something about it. Um, so I wanted everybody to know that uh, I have had a very good time knowing just how many people are aware and awake and ready to stand up and do something to change the country. Uh, certainly 
where the donations are coming from is the most important aspect of this. Uh, all over the world, uh, 13 different countries in four different currencies so far. It has been truly amazing how many people have stood up and uh, wanted to do something. Um, what I'm going to do is so uh, people know who they are, uh, I am going to cut off kind of the list of donations after this broadcast. And so everybody that's donated this far, uh, whenever I talk about the captains of light, that's you guys. That's who has stepped up first. And since in Navy rank, uh, captains are probably the most uh, important officers in uh, the Navy. That's why I'm using that. And it makes it easy so, for me to talk. Everybody afterwards will be commanders of light. So um, what I want everybody to do, uh, since you're ready to do something, is uh, get that link that Tommy's putting up with all those reference materials and you're going to find that uh, Senior Chief Don Shipley and the Special Investigator, uh, his title is Forensic Psychologi Psychological Investigative Criminologist. I don't know what that means, but it sounds really important. His name is Dennis uh, Chevalier. Um, and those two gentlemen um, need to hear everybody's voice and understand that we are ready to stand up for something good in this world. I don't want any negative. I don't want any attacks. I want you to send them your love and your light and to show them that there is more people out there than they could possibly imagine that are ready to do something for change. And hopefully that will be a nice little demonstration slash exercise of the ability that we do have to affect change if we stick together, if we work together, and if we show people as a group what's going on in this country. Because like David and I talked about in the last interview, we both see the changes. We both know what's going on and how people are changing their attitudes. And they're not going to accept fear anymore. They're not going to accept being bullied. And they're not going to accept uh, the propaganda that's put up against the people that are trying to do the most good in the world so as to disvalue the information and the truths that they're putting up. So if you guys could, uh, you know, be good captains of light and express that you want them to understand that there is support out there for what Carrie is doing, for what I'm doing, for what David is doing, for what Eve is doing, and that things need to change, and that you are going to help with that change, and no amount of disinformation that they put out will bring that, uh, will not make that happen. Um, okay, um, Bill, I just want to interrupt you here one second, because a lot of people are curious uh, about Eva. Uh, obviously, she's a new name and a new face. Could you introduce her briefly anyway at this point? Uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to keep with whatever schedule uh, yes. protocols you'd like to have, but I do want you to at least give her some kind of introduction. Um, we will try to bring her on screen during the time when she's actively in, involved and, and try to focus on you when, when that's not happening. But uh, yes, if you could please give her background. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's let us uh Let's bring her in right now because uh, I think she's got some important stuff to say to everybody and we'll just let that happen. Um, everybody that uh, has seen my second interview with David and Carrie and Bill uh, knows Eva. Uh, they may not know it, but uh, uh, during the interview I did kind of blurt out of nowhere about this uh, person that I was having this connection with during all the chaos that I was uh, going through to get to safety. And uh, I will, after Eva speaks, talk about uh, where I've gone and what I'm doing and the kind of support that I'm getting. Uh, but uh, I mentioned that there was this person that I had this special connection with that was, uh, you know, on my mind during the interview. Uh, I had only spoken to her. We had exchanged emails twice, um, and I was too busy to understand, you know, what was going on with this connection. Uh, but I think it would be nice to have 
Eva explain kind of what was going on on her end during that part of the interview. Okay. Um, yeah. Everybody, Carrie? Yeah, absolutely. Go okay. ahead. Okay. I can't hear you, Carrie. Is that normal? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. Uh, what I do is I everyone should mute themselves when the other person is talking. That way we avoid a, a looping uh, audio thing. But I'm sorry, I forgot uh, to unmute myself. So yes, okay. absolutely. Go right ahead. Okay. Well, um, first of all, I want to start by thanking you, Carrie. And um, I just see this as such an exciting time in this world. And I come forward today as a civilian. Um, just an everyday average person who has followed a golden thread of information that led to another packet of information and then folded into another packet of information set and um, that led to Bill. And um, when he came forward, I had just recently uh, somehow stumbled upon Kay Griggs interview with Reverend Strawcutter in um, 1998, I think it was the original date, and Kay Griggs was a phenomenal role model for me. Um, if I were to back up, I'd say, you know, through my own personal experiences, I've sought out strong females, and um, I'd say Naomi Wolf was a, probably the first person that uh, brought me forward into understanding what was happening in the United States in her End of America documentary, where she documents systematically uh, for listeners um, or viewers uh, to really understand um, uh, what the steps are and they're a blueprint and she organized them for people to be able to really um, have a primer I guess as she calls it uh, to understand this is what a would-be despot would do to destabilize a country. Um, so then, you know, that set the tone for me to really be present to what's unfolding in our, in our current um, situation globally. And um, Kay Griggs, anyways, Kay Griggs, I stumbled upon her not too long ago, and I see this fierce woman come forward with such a brave heart, and I just want to thank her on behalf of all military personnel. Um, she came forward in 1998 on behalf of all of these people and had the courage to put it out there. And her knowledge was based on her husband, who was a colonel, who was in charge of dirty tricks, um, and a journal that she had photocopied. And she presented the information to Reverend Strawcutter. And, you know, in that, she goes into um, specifically the lifestyle of, of SEALs, and she does go into specifically the Navy SEALs, SEAL Team, I can't remember which one it was, but it was, uh, I think SEAL Team 6, um, and she, she speaks about uh, Eight. how, Muslim. sorry? Are we back? Uh, hold on one second, we're, we're working on that. <laughs> okay. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Now, um, still live, and uh, I don't think that it, it actually broke broke up on the live stream. It um, it just broke up on the Skype. So uh, sorry you were interrupted there, Eva. Um, That's all right. Uh, we're going to continue this. I think what you know the trigger word was um, the NS, <laughs> the Navy SEAL. So let's go and try to continue with this. Go right ahead. So we okay. were saying SEAL so, Team 8, I believe. SEAL Team 8 was the trigger. Okay. So um, Kay Griggs talks about a SEAL team in Virginia Beach, and um, she talks about the transgressions. And she, she, in her interview in 1998, this is, you know, it's been out there for a while, she talks about how, you know, they picked a girl in a bar, a beautiful young woman, I think she was a doctor, gang raped her and she was strangled to death and uh, in her documentary case speaks um, about uh, how nothing much came of that so um, you know to hear this 
you know, well-kept, well-to-do, socialite woman who's very educated, speak passionately and fervently about what she believes is necessary to come forward um, as a patriot to share with everyone. Uh, it said that that was my primer for when I witnessed Bill's first interview. And um, thank God to her. Thank you, Kate, <laughs> for having the courage to come forward. Um, so again, she, she validates the lifestyle transgressions and how they're used to keep um, you know, personnel in line and to ensure that they then are able to have clearance. She validates um, you know, her husband having prior knowledge to 9-11, um, which would also coincide with uh, Bill's comments about this village that was... Um, then blown up. Um, you know, she does say that there was a direct correlation between the Navy SEALs and the building systematically of assassins to then have the option to blame the Arabs. Um, and then she goes into secret societies and um, you know, the nurturing that goes into systematically pulling out special, um, they call them special rising stars, uh, and they have a criteria, and one is, um, you know, prior sexual uh, abuse at a young age, and, you know, that fits into the mind control patterning as well. And so this is what the thread I followed was uh, that led me to what would seem like these weird, un correlated instances actually having the mind control thread um, unite all of them, you know, to the transgressions that happened with the reservation schools and the Catholic schools and, um, you know, people let okay. go. And um, so, let me ask you this, uh, Eva, so in terms of your own personal information though, are, are you simply coming forward to reiterate the information from uh, from Griggs, or did you have anything, uh, and, and you know, if it's not right now, that's fine, we can do it later, whatever organization you guys have going on, but basically people are going to wonder, is this, uh, is, is your information, is there any direct information that you have to give in, in regard to this case, or things related to this case, or are you simply coming on uh, to sort of reiterate the evidence that was brought forward by, by other people like Griggs? Okay, so my involvement and my coming forward today is as a civilian who has my own personal experience but is not related to directly to what Bill's um, bringing forward. But what I'm coming forward is as someone who's had um, kind of an aha moment and shared it with Bill um, in that, I believe, Carrie, in the first interview, you directly asked Bill if what he experienced was mind control and what we have discovered in conversations is that he actually had no prior um, big picture understanding of, of the systematic nature, the pattern, the pathological um, pattern that is running through society and he said no to you and he said well I felt like I was you know my mind was destroyed but he didn't actually get that um, there's others out there and how how crucial his coming forward on behalf of all of these people has already through a quantum perspective transformed the collective pathology He's already demonstrated that you can come forward as a fallible human being who's not perfect, who's, who has committed transgressions, who had them used against him, and he's owned it. He stepped up, and he has brought forward, even in the face of all of that humiliation, um, vital, vital you know, information. And so through our conversations, and this is why... Bill has asked me to come forward is to share, you know, what I brought to him and what I saw in him and what has now come forward. My background, um, 
because of what I've gone through, I've been studying something called holodynamics dynamics for the past five years, and it's a uh, basically a mashup of all of the different sciences, um, and it's the application of holographics, the applications of quantum physics, developmental science, and information theory, and that allowed me to be present to what Bill brought forward and create the space for him to then take the next step forward. So, um, okay. Well, thank you. That's, that's lovely. And, and I appreciate your statement. That's, that's, that's great. Um, and it is absolutely true and important. Um, at this point, Bill, simply because people, you know, we're trying to, to move with this, sort of moving target here and people are going to be very much curious in terms of the mystery guest is uh, Eva the mystery guest or do you have another person who was coming forward and is there um, did you want to go in a certain direction at this point um, no Eva is the mystery guest and uh, like she was saying um, when she uh, when we began to speak uh, after the second interview, uh, she had a tremendous amount of knowledge and insight into what I'd gone through. She'd been studying uh, the effects of mind control and what's been done uh, to many, many military members as well as uh, uh, people in civilian society and how this has affected uh, all of the people that have the information, that could come forward, that could offer more of the picture than just me. And I think it's very critical that uh, uh, she was will be able to uh, talk about these issues. And I'm hoping, hoping beyond hope, that uh, her perspective will affect people the way it's affected me. And that it is a massive problem. And it's a massive problem that she's been studying for a very long time. And hopefully it will give other people the courage to understand that there are people out there, number one, that understand what you have gone through, and number two, that can help with the nonsense and garbage that uh, seemingly controls people's lives just like it controlled mine. Um, I was ultimately always hung up on the control that the military had over me with my charges and uh, never thought people would listen to me because of what I'd done. Um, she has proven that that is not the case and that uh, the insight that she has, I think, would make it possible for people to come forward, say what's happened to them, and get the help that they need. Because she has also shown me that there is a bunch of people out there that would bend over backwards to help people in the military and people in society that have been hurt by these people that would use individuals like pawns in their own little sick game. Um, a lot of information that she has validates things that David Wilcox has said in financial tyranny as well. So I think that it's critical that, uh, you know, she was able to come on and uh, I think she'll speak a lot to some of the hard to believe issues and hard to believe information just because it's so sick and so vile that it's tough to understand that there is these elite people that would use people as use people for the most horrible horrible purposes that anybody could possibly imagine so okay um, um well thank you for that could, yeah. thank you uh what Maybe at this point, though, people will be wondering, uh, you wanted to bring forward some evidence, right, uh, in regard to certain things, and 
Um, I'm not sure how you want to proceed in that regard, but maybe you should start off with that. Okay. Um, yeah, let's do that. Um, basically, uh, Carrie, you kind of touched on it. Um, there is a system out there that if they can't intimidate you into being quiet, they will hurt you. And you mentioned the legal way. They will come after you legally on baseless charges and cause you to spend massive amounts of time, massive amounts of uh, money, and massive amounts of uh, effort so that you can't focus on the task at hand, which is, you know, doing some good. Um, I did say, and I will speak to the information that I do have, uh, I did, I do have uh, some information if everybody uh, that has that link open can go ahead and check out those zip files, uh, that zip file, because I will be addressing the information in, uh, in that zip file. Um, I am going to be speaking about some personal things. I am going to be addressing some issues that people are probably going to find hard to believe. Um, but the real issue with my investigations in Las Vegas was uh, determining that uh, the real crime problem in Las Vegas had nothing to do with the criminals. It had to do with the law enforcement. Um, let me begin by saying that uh, in the end of 08, the beginning of 09, uh, I'll just start off with my experiences and how I know about this criminal enterprise that exists. Uh, I made a choice to turn away uh, my DAIA handlers and tell them that uh, I wouldn't uh, play along anymore, I guess is the best way, and uh, cut off all contact. Uh, shortly after that, if everybody could uh, reference Police Incident 33009, uh, that is a document of a police report. Um, my girlfriend at the time uh, was arrested for a crime that she did not commit, uh, but it didn't matter. The cops did it because they could, not because there was an actual crime committed. Uh, if you read through that document, you will find uh, some shocking information. Uh, the charge that she was uh, given was uh, solicitation of prostitution. Um, I was able to get in the middle of what was happening, and I did see uh, the crimes that were committed by these officers. Uh, number one, uh, they made these accusations with no evidence, only their good word to back up any allegations of crime. Uh, number two, uh, they were drinking during this investigation and consumed a massive amount of alcohol uh, during this time that they were conducting this investigation. Uh, they, they arrested several other women during this time and <coughs> I was able to uh, get to where uh, Holly was being arrested uh, before she was taken away and I watched three officers from Las Vegas Metro Police Department haul away uh, three women each in, a, uh, in unmarked cars and took them to Clark County Detention Center after drinking. It is absolutely abhorrible and excusable and unexcusable that after these allegations were discovered to be true, that every one of these women had to spend $2,000 on an attorney. An attorney's name is Michael Gowdy, he's quite famous in Las Vegas, so if anybody doubts my word, uh, they can go ahead and uh, check this out through him, but there is also public records uh, that this can all be backed up with. Uh, the only thing that happened was when they discovered that they were caught doing these wrongs, uh, they simply drop the charges. Um, and they know that they got away with it. Um, there's 
can't be any complaint. There can't be any investigation because they're the ones that control the investigating. They're the ones that control the fact that the police department can get away with these things because they are also the people that investigate themselves. That uh, led to many, many minor incidents of police harassment uh, during this time and me becoming increasingly belligerent to the police and pointing out these actions and how I was now stating that they were breaking the law, that they were acting like the criminals, and that they were the biggest problem in Las Vegas as far as crime went. That led up to the events of April 23rd of 2011. Uh, on that day, um, I was uh, arrested on the way to a show, a uh, fitness competition, um, where I was charged with the crime of failure to register as a sex offender. Um, you will see three documents. Uh, one is a complaint for an injunction, second is an injunction, and the third is a letter to the presiding judge. Um, I think I can easily say that those three documents made prosecuting me for the crime that I was charged with absolutely impossible. Uh, the fourth document that you will see is the district attorney's uh, dismissal of my charges. Um, and again, this is the second time in my life that I've been involved in police charging, arresting, and dropping the charges. Um, I also have significant amount of evidence that they had every intention of continuing to arrest me and drop the charges to harass my life as much as humanly possible. Um, there's also one thing that I need to kind of point out to everybody that really tells a story about what's going on. Um, this is not the first time that I've been investigated by a major private investigation firm. Um, if everybody wants to check out uh, dbeckerinvestigations.com, you can see a website uh, that is dedicated, uh, and if you look at the history tab, you will see that there are several uh, brothers that run this uh, investigations firm. Um, I've also included in there a uh, file that's called uh, Defector HTM. If you open that up on a web browser, I think you will see that there's uh, a difference between the current site and the former site. Apparently, uh, the backers didn't realize that Google archives web pages. So I pulled the archive off after they changed it. And you will notice that uh, on the one that I'm giving you, there is a Brian Becker. And that he gives his information out quite clearly about what he does for a living. Um, I would point out that because Detective DeBecker works for Las Vegas Metro Police Department and this private investigations firm. That is a firm conflict of interest. That is against the law. And they took Brian DeBecker's name off the website, so I couldn't show people this information. But I think it's very telling that once they know that I found the website and that I knew that they were committing a crime, that they took his name off in order to hide the truth. Unfortunately, I was able to get the truth before they could destroy it. Um, I've also included another link. Uh, this is Brian DeBecker shooting incident in uh, the list of links uh, from the Las, uh, Las Vegas Review Journal. Uh, I think everybody should check that out uh, because one of my other allegations against the uh, Metro Police Department is that they are able to murder and assassinate people and let themselves get away with it because they control the judicial process that makes it so they're the ones that determine if their own shootings were justifiable or not. Uh, during, uh, in this system that they have, uh, they present to a jury 
only the evidence that they want the jury to hear that exonerates them. Um, during this process, and it's been highly debated in Las Vegas, you can do some research on it, but there is no contrary information. So if you're a jurist, and you're only given one side of the story, there's only one way you can decide because you have no contrary information. I've also in, uh, uh, included three other links of three other separate shootings. Uh, one gentleman was shot in the back with handcuffs on. Another gentleman was shot without a weapon. And then a very famous case uh, uh, is the last one, or I'm sorry, is the uh, second link. Uh, a gentleman from West Point, and I'm trying not to name names, Carrie, that's why I'm being purposely vague. Uh, people can look this up on their own if they want the names and discover what's really going on in Las Vegas. Uh, but this gentleman was at a Costco, and Cop and the police department was called in because uh, somebody saw him with a weapon. Uh, this, this gentleman was a West Point graduate and had concealed weapons from it and was challenged about that weapon and directly addressed the people that he had a concealed weapons permit. Uh, this gentleman was shot dead in front of Costco by Las Vegas Metro Police Department, three officers, um, while attempting to turn over to the officers his holstered weapon. There was no threat, he couldn't have hurt anybody with it, and he was trying to do the right thing. And they shot him, and they killed him. Uh, the article on Detective DeBecker shows that uh, he has actually been involved in three shooting incidents. And so it puts me in genuine fear when somebody that has a record of killing three people as a police officer for no justifiable reason other than he can get away with it now coming after me. Uh, that's the level that we're talking about at. Uh, okay, so um, Bill... These are where I'm coming from when I say that I've done some investigations and I have found some major things going on. And these are issues that are radiating throughout Las Vegas right now. And the average citizen does know that there's a massive problem with what the police department is doing. And I think it bears that it, uh, it gets some more than national attention because it is very much the fact that right now, currently, it would be very easy for the FBI to investigate and charge the Las Vegas Metro Police Department on RICO charges, acting as a criminal organization based on the law, if they chose to. Okay. And that uh, I would like to bring out. Thank you. Thank you, Bill. Uh, but I, I have to say that at this moment, what we're dealing with are... Um, uh, well, is a secret government that that is uh, uses that uh, with uh, that notion with poetic less license, let's say, and um, mm -hmm. goes far above and beyond what uh, that police department is probably guilty of on a daily basis. Um, and so, what we need to do is uh, simply because this is Project Camelot, and I appreciate that information. I think that having it out there will be um, a good thing to to have, no doubt about it. But I, I know that our listeners are, are, are most interested to know, in, in sort of a little bit more uh, general terms, how this pertains to your story um, and to, to, to added information that we're, we are uh, attempting to bring forward in this interview, simply about um, your experience possibly as a, a remote viewer uh, using, you know, to look beyond looking glass. Um, and possibly clarifying some things that are still left unanswered. Um, we are gathering questions as we go here, and I'm, I'm hoping that at a certain point we'll be able to go to that list of questions and, and answer the questions that are in the audience. But people are basically saying um, that they know that police departments, I know certainly um, police departments around the country are guilty of all kinds of, uh, of acts of, of sort of unprovoked violence, etc. But how does this pertain to to your sort of story at this time and how can we um, place this in a little bit better context in terms of who you are and uh, the fact that you are 
a Navy SEAL who worked uh, on above top secret uh, missions. Um, okay. Um, what I'm doing, Carrie, is I, I, this is such a broad subject, and there's so much information that has been layered on, on top of layers on top of layers that it is important that I peel the layers back of this story so I can show people from start to beginning how the system works. And the system is based on a lot of different pieces of information. Um, uh, Eva has some more insight that she could share about this uh, little secret world uh, and how it operates and how uh, this first layer of this police corruption um, covers up another layer of criminality that David Wilcock has also spoke about in Financial Tyranny. Um, Eva, do you want to kind of go okay. into that and address that? Yes. Okay, so again, I come forward as a civilian who um, has done research. And my capacity right now is to be present with what is out there and just share with the listeners some may or may not have the understanding. I think for the most part your viewers are very, very, you know, very well educated on all of these issues. Um, I'm just presenting what I feel is valid to Bill and what then in that sharing with Bill evolved the consciousness of the conversation that Bill was then um, able to be present to. Um, so a lot of this has in my um, <laughs> limited civilian understanding, just research that I could do, um, has to do with, you know, Project Paperclip, the um, <laughs> the experiments that happened in Auschwitz, uh, the level of um, knowledge that they had about compartmentalization, um, the research also that they gained from Japan after the, at the end of World War II, uh, the research that they did in Unit uh, 731, I believe it was, and human experiments, and um, you know, then that went to work uh, through uh, Project Paperclip, and um, that was Truman, and you know, it went through all different areas of society. Uh, from what I understand, um, military, um, political, government, um, you know, you see it in the Catholic school system in the reservation, the way that the, the reservation people were treated. And um, I think the thing, the key is that it's, there's two forms of mind control. There's the original trauma-based mind control that so many people have suffered from. And you have so many people coming forward independently, separate from one another, um, with very similar stories. And Bill was not aware of any of these people. And this is why I think it's important, is that there are other people out there, and this is why I come forward today to say, you know, there are other people out there who went through the things that Bill's gone through, and people like Kathy O'Brien and Bryce Taylor and Arizona Wilder and Duncan, you know, who, again, it seems so isolated and weird, like, oh, that's strange. Um, but then if you understand and can get a primer, like Naomi presents with the destabilization of society, if you have a primer to understand the systematic ritualistic abuse that happens to these people, then you can identify it in all of these separate categories where you would think they're unrelated, but they're not. And so when you get that big picture actually coming into a focus, and then you understand that it's now gone to another layer from trauma-based mind control into electromagnetic mind control for the masses, that is huge because then you understand somebody like Bill shouldn't be here. He shouldn't have the capacity to come forward and override that systematic pathological abuse that was, you know, years worth of research gone into implementation. And he found a way, you know, through neuroplasticity or, you know, spirituality. He's 
somehow bypassed that blackness and channeled his own consciousness through it. And, and then, in the face of all of this dehumanization, had the capacity to find a way to come forward on behalf of all of these people. And in my view, based on a holographic principle, we understand in nature, not, you, don't, you don't get a problem coming forward without the solution already being present. Whether or not we have the capacity to be present to the solution is the, is the conversation that I'd like to bring up today, right? Because if Bill is going forward, okay. yeah? <laughs> Could you come specifically into Kathy O'Brien? That's a very important piece to what I need to share. Okay. Um, so Kathy O'Brien, from my understanding, is a very um, unique, brave woman. And uh, we did include a link to um, her most recent uh, lecture that she gave, um, I think it was about two years ago. In it as well, Dr. Colin Ross, was present. Um, he is head of the Ross Institute, who I've also, you know, had the privilege to speak with in regards to Bill. Thank you, Dr. Ross. Um, he's written two books on CIA mind control and the doctors and the um, the associations behind, you know, this momentum, this pathological uh, implementation of mind control. So there are people that have been identified as experts. I I am civilian who's done some research. Okay, I come and, forward. Uh, let's. But but with that in mind, and and I absolutely mean no offense. And thank you, you know, very much, Eva, for for coming forward in this sort of unusual situation to to speak uh, on behalf of Bill. But what we have to do is simply because this this group of listeners are uh, very familiar with mind control um, I've had Colin yep. I've had Colin Ross on my radio show actually more than once um, and yep. we have um, Duncan O'Finney is, is probably the most well-known uh, individual the super soldier on Project Camelot but there are many others and in fact I would venture to say that every whistleblower I've dealt with has been a victim if you want to call that uh, of being a victim of mind control. Um, the general populace is, of course, being exposed to this as we speak, electromagnetically, etc. And and mm -hmm. I, I really appreciate that you are somebody who has investigated this in depth. Um, but I do I do have a very uh, restless group of, of listeners here, and what we need to do is kind of drill down a little quicker into the nuts and bolts of Bill's experience because um, lots of people can go out and, and watch on YouTube Kathy O'Brien yeah. and read her books, etc., yeah. etc. So let's let's and rather than reiterate um, that, let's right. let's bring uh, Bill and why don't you talk specifically about your experience, uh, perhaps during the six months that at least you remember being um, you know messed with mentally. Uh, and perhaps if you'd like to go into the years before that, what, what else might have been going on uh, with, with your team members, even? I, I think it would be extremely beneficial, Carrie, if uh, I let Eva finish what she was talking about, about Kathy O'Brien, because we are definitely going somewhere with it. Um, you certainly have to understand the background to what I need to talk about, and Eva can present that far better than I can about some things that I need to disclose. And so if you could please, uh, Eva, speak specifically on Kathy O'Brien, her experiences, and what that led to uh, with Corey. Please. Okay. Um, well, I mean, Kathy came forward and she shared without fear, you know, her uh, presidential uh, experiences and she named names, right? That's a big deal. Um, and I think it's important, Carrie, um, if, if Bill can come forward without knowing the totality of what he experienced and that there is a systematic approach to it and that there are others, that's important to identify um, because then that means there's so, so many more people out there that have been in Bill's shoes that perhaps could identify with some of the more specific, you know, tactics that the Navy feels um, 
experienced military officers and whatnot, but the, the, the fact that he's come forward with that with full picture and understanding it, that is pathologic, too, in our society, that we don't, even the people it's happening to may not be, including everyday people who are exposed to it, right? So that's what I really wanted to stress. Um, sorry if I take too long. Um, Kathy O'Brien and Corey. Um, well, I, I think what you're alluding to, Bill, is he, Bill, because of his background in Las Vegas, which is why I think also it's important that he brought forward the information he just did, he was exposed to a variety of public figures. And, you know, Kathy O'Brien had Roseanne Barr come forward um, to introduce her. And, um, you know, Bryce Taylor speaks um, about Bob Hope and the, you know, influence that Bob Hope had in Hollywood. And then you have people like Corey who come forward and announce that they're going to expose, you know. Corey Feldman. Corey yeah, Feldman. Corey Feldman. Um, expose, you know, high-level Hollywood people, players, as pedophiles. And... Kathy O'Brien states very clearly that she, it originated with her father, um, so she was sexually abused and also her father took child pornographic images and would market them out. And what would happen is the CIA had tasked to the mafia on the child pornography rings and they would source out these parents who were, um, you know, exposing their children to child pornography because it, it meant that they had experienced torture of some sort or some kind of trauma between the ages of zero and six. That applies to Bill. Um, the reason why they wanted to seek out these children is because they understood a couple of things. One was that it, it set the foundation for compartmentalization of their conscious brain and would then seek them out, also with the understanding that it would heighten their senses. So in Kathy's words, what this trauma does is it blasts you into parts of your brain that the majority of our civilization isn't encouraged to understand or evolve with, probably on purpose. But when trauma occurs, it's like bodybuilding. Lift something really heavy, you get microtrauma to the tissue, your body goes to build a better system to make sure that trauma doesn't happen again. So what Kathy explains is her visual acuity was heightened. Her sixth sense was heightened. Um, you know, psychic is the word she used, you know, and that would explain perhaps why, you know, and I don't, I, Bill was chosen for one of the projects, and I mean, there's lots, and I don't know about Duncan, you may, I, you know, may, may have missed some of Duncan's interviews, but it seems to be that the fundamental key first part is that there has to be some kind of trauma that is experienced from zero to six, and that's the theta portion, and then, you know, Bill, is that what you wanted me to speak on? Well, and, uh, you know, basically, uh, in Corey's show, he states that the biggest problem in Hollywood is pedophilia. And uh, what I can tell the listeners is um, I can back him up 100%. Uh, there is just the most massive amount of vile control over... I would say most or all actors, especially child actors and actresses, uh, singers, superstars, models, um, they, the elite treat Hollywood like their personal play toys. And um, one thing that I do uh, have some experience <laughs> in with uh, being in Las Vegas and participating in all the activities that uh, I did was that I did get the opportunity to meet Corey and spend some time with him. And Corey may not remember me, but I guarantee he would remember Tony and Hope and Joy and Brett and know that we have spent a lot of time together and we did have a conversation together. 
And he, he is very desirous to write a book and blow the lid off of all of yeah. the vileness and all the disgusting and name names and tell people exactly what David was saying, this Namblet issue. It's, it goes deeper and grace. harder than anybody could possibly imagine. And I think if I could say one thing to Corey, it's that he should definitely consider seeking out Mars Callahan. And he and Mars could definitely seek out Holly, and Holly would find me, and we could get them to uh, a safe place where they could tell their story and not worry about anything happening to them that would be bad, or anybody that uh, could come after them and hurt them. And I don't know their experiences. I can't testify to their experiences. Uh, but certainly there's been enough conversations that I believe that there is plenty of people and that Corey is ready to come forward and would come forward if he, could, if he knew he could do so safely. So, as somebody that I've spent time conversing with, Corey, if you really want to get rid of all this garbage that's in your head and that you fear, just like I feared, there's help, there's plenty of people that would fix what's broken, and you could, he could really come forward and show that the people that run this country are the people that are destroying this country. And they do so at the most disgusting and diabolical rate, and they hurt people indiscriminately. And if you are disgusted and appalled by the things that I have admitted to in my life, then you should take the time to pay attention and understand how bad it is, and how much it happens, and how there's people out there that this has been happening to their entire lives, and they can't do anything about it because they're so entranced alone. They in, think they're alone. In, in being alone. And this my and you. it quite simply is. And okay. Eva has identified it in me, so I would like to present that as something that I could... Well, and like, doesn't even see the correlation, and that's what I'm saying. I, throw, I followed this thread, and what seems like these compartmentalized weirdness issues, you know, Corey Feldman, Britney Spears, people going off the deep end, and weird stuff, right? When you follow the thread, you understand the primer of mind control, what it looks like, and the two... Com the two branches of it, where it's trauma-based or now electromagnetic, then you can kind of say, okay, the, the, the veil is starting to come down, you can identify it a little bit easier, and, and Bill is so crucial, it needs to be celebrated, and I will ask everyone out there to understand this, because this is fundamental. You get people like, you know, Benjamin Fulford coming forward and saying, why aren't the military arresting these people? Um, well, well, Bill is a great example of why they're not, because they have these transgressions that they've got against them, and it's compiled. Well, I'm here to say, if you look at things from a holographic pr principle, you know, what's known to the parts, known to the whole, Bill's come forward, the ball is rolling, it's already done, it goes back to what he's talking about with the two timelines, it's already happening, the chess game has happened, it's just unfolding now, and conversations like this where we share our experiences is what consciousness evolving, our information sets coming together through discussion, sharing is what will have consciousness, you know, um, expand based on Okay, it. so thank you, Carrie. All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I, okay, at this point, though, what we need to do, though, you know, and, and this, this particular live stream has has been sort of put out there because people and people have come to see this and it's not that anything you've said is invalid it's absolutely extremely important and I understand how it's leading in a direction uh, in the, in the direction of, of what may have been Bill's childhood but at this point what we need to do is we need to focus on the original um, the original testimony 
And Bill, if you wish to augment that testimony at this time with specifics from your past that relate to the testimony, in other words, yes, we, we are what we're getting here as a listener is that you possibly were traumatized between the ages of, of zero and six. Um, whether or not that's true, I don't know. But, but at this moment, rather than sort of making it such a big discussion, we actually need to, to sort of focus it down and let's, let's talk and, and hear from you, Bill, specifically about what are the incidents, what is the, the experiences that you had that you perhaps can fill in some more of the gaps in the testimony that you originally gave, um, both on the live stream before and on my interview with you. Um, well, let me give you uh, let me give you exactly what you're asking for, and talk about my personal experiences and what I went through, and um, how it's been for me to understand to help everybody understand why this needs to be talked about. Um, after I was taken out of service, uh, I was placed into a mental hospital and drugged basically out of my mind and denied any sense Sensory of deprivation. Yeah. any sense of knowledge of where I was, uh, what day it was, what time of the day it was. Um, my senses and what I could take in were controlled. And this process built up this veneer over my memories until this veneer became my reality. And all this did was put a picture that any time I looked into my memories, I would see. Um, but there's inconsistencies with this picture. Um, it never fit when I really thought about it, what had really happened in my life. And what had really happened in my life came back to me in visions and nightmares and dreams. And the imperfections in this veneer or this alternative memory that kept me from understanding what was really going on, what uh, my true memories were, uh, was extremely difficult to deal with. It makes you feel crazy. And there's no other way to put it. Um, and so you keep it inside and you accept that every time you try to delve into the subject, uh, you experience a lot of trauma about trying to bring it out. Um, okay, so at this moment, I, I understand that that's, in general, what you're experiencing, but when, when you bring this side of things up, what the listeners are doing is they are actually going back to the nuts and bolts of the testimony and they're saying, okay, in a sense, what you might be doing in their eyes is, is invalidating some of the testimony. They're wondering whether or not what you experienced before you were uh, sort of mind controlled, etc., really happened. And I have a number of questions along those lines. Would it be helpful to you for me to ask you those questions? Um, well, if I could finish, that would be great. Okay. Um, basically, The veneer is inconsistent, and it falls apart. And which is which is typical of, of programming when somebody hits that what's you know around thirties to forty, the the hormones, the neuroplasticity changes, and the programming no longer can function the way, and so these veneers, the holes start to to present present themselves. So that's you know what's important for them to be able to understand is that's part of why they may want to get custody of him. <laughs> and I've been eliminating so much of the garbage that it's now clear that the mind control was the mind control 
and the memories are the memories, and it's easy to separate which is which. And I can go back and I can see things more clearly. I can also see how they've been trying to get me back into custody to fix what I've undone. And now that these true memories are coming out, uh, the system in large is getting very desperate to make sure that everybody sees things exactly the way you're stating them. Oh, he's just a crazy. Oh, they're inconsistent memories. Oh, they're dreams. No, they're not dreams. They are reality. My dreams were trying to wake me up to what was real. And it's difficult for the average person to understand how this works. It is difficult for people to understand and accept somebody can change your mind so horribly that you will literally not believe in your memories. And I am trying to come forward and say that I figured out how to beat this process and how to understand what really happened in my life. And that this six months of reprogramming through drugs and probably other means since I would wake up and have no idea how long I'd been asleep during this process, that I have no idea what was done to me. But I do know what's happening now, and I do see very clearly that this is what is real. This is what is happening. This is what the military has become, is a bunch of psychopathic killers that once they're at the end of their service, you take them in, you pump them full of drugs, you change the way they think, and then you put them in society. And if things don't work out, you let them kill themselves. Because yes. it's a much cleaner process than fixing the problems that are associated with killing. People need to understand that these soldiers that are coming home, that have killed people, that have done the most horrible things in human terms, are now walking around desperately seeking a solution to what's going on in their heads, and the drugs, and the reprogramming, and people that participate in this system keep military members in check by getting them to believe in things that are not real. And that's what it really comes down to, is that there is so much illusion, there is so much lack of reality in this country right now, that it's critical that okay. we all try to understand what's going on. That we all take a step back and say, maybe these people that are out there are just trying to give us enough information for us to have our aha moment and say, I get what you're saying and I want to support you and I want to help you. And I've gotten tons, hundreds and hundreds of emails saying just that thing. And, you know, people are waking up to what's being said, but unless you get somebody to come out and say, yeah, my brain got broken really, really, really bad, and I've been able to fix the damage up to a point that I can understand what was done to me, and I can speak about it clearly, that it not be invalidated simply because people don't want to believe that it's possible. So okay. if you would like to ask me questions now, Carrie, I would be more than happy to answer. All right. Thank you. Uh, at this moment, I, I again have to stress for the rest of this, this interview that you are, in a sense, uh, you know, what you're trying to do is talk to an audience that actually isn't here at this time. Now, perhaps once we get this onto the YouTube, we will get to a more general audience. The people that have, have been waiting for this interview and have been following what has been going on in Camelot and therefore came back, 
have this background. They understand this. So, so I, I appreciate that you wanted to stress these things, but you must understand that they already are there. They're with you. They understand what you have to say, and they agree with you. Um, at this moment, however, we, we do have people that, um, in other words, because you have had these uh, sort of very wide experiences, you were apparently a Navy SEAL who was sent on above top secret missions, and you were then also um, involved in bombing Iraq during the years uh, between 1991 and 2000 when supposedly the US government wasn't even there. In other words, Yes, your, your mind control sh throws things into question, but if you can answer some direct questions, you know, that will help uh, people who are listening because their issue is not with whether or not you are mind controlled. They actually believe that for the most part, I would say. Um, what their, it, their question is, is whether this, this entire story hangs together such that they can take it and, and basically kind of run with it um, bring it to their family and friends, bring it to the people that are out on the, on the, in the mainstream and so on and so forth. So let's, let's see if we can drill down to a few nuts and bolts here. Um, through the question is, questions that, that are coming up in the audience, and if any question is something that you can't answer, all you need to do is say, I can't answer that because of my security oath, or you can't answer it because you simply don't remember because of the mind control you know situation or whatever in other words those are all valid answers and we totally will understand um, but let me at least ask the questions okay yeah, fire me and let me do my best okay all right uh, so I have a person who is saying what division off the defense department trained you in remote viewing in area 51 are you able to say that? No. <laughs> Not even a little bit. Uh, okay. Based on the fact that I wasn't even given that information. I will tell you the story. Um, I was flown into Area 51. We landed at Groom Lake on the little red stripe, you know, jet that everybody sees flying out of Henderson Executive Terminal a couple of times a day. Uh, when we landed, we were placed in a van that uh, we couldn't see out of, and we were driven to a facility. Uh, when we got to the facility, it was completely enclosed. Uh, we were walked into a classroom, and we were taken into that classroom. We were never allowed to go anywhere else except for the bathroom, and the bathroom was right next door, and we were escorted inside the bathroom when we went there. Uh, the training worked only because it is easy to believe you can do these extraordinary things if somebody shows you it's possible. Um, it's a little difficult to explain to the average person, but if somebody demonstrates telepathy in your presence, your mind believes that telepathy is possible, and therefore, your mind understands that you can do it. Once you understand you can do it, or you believe you can do it, it's very easy for somebody to give you that ability, quote unquote, but realistically, we already have that ability, we are just blind to it. Okay, we that, that... our entire lives. And so, this is how the process worked with this training. Uh, we were taught in 10 different areas that gave us heightened extrasensory abilities or seemingly extrasensory abilities. But what I would tell people is that these are abilities that we don't all possess. Um, certainly, if you were never allowed to open your eyes, you wouldn't understand sight. It's kind of the same thing. Okay, um, let me ask you this because I, I have been reading over some of the documents you gave me and what I've noticed is that you've never talked about who your trainer was at Area 51. Um, okay, that's easy. 
Uh, <laughs> this will be a little bit hard for most people to believe because... Not the Camelot audience, so don't even go right. there. Okay, so my first experience, uh, first day in training, we get trotted into the room, we all sit down and they inform us that our trainer will be an alien. We all look at each other like, yeah, bullshit. And then they trot in your stereotypical four foot high gray gray. And he starts to tell us what we're thinking. It was quite shocking and seemed unreal for the entire day. And yet by the end of the day, you can't imagine how much we were able to do with our minds. And throughout the course of the next two weeks, that's how we spent our days. Uh, when we were done with class each day, we were put back in the van. The van took us to the plane. The plane took us to Las Vegas. And we stayed in a hotel. Okay, and, and the, the alien, the so-called gray, um, excuse me, the so-called gray spoke to you how? Um, both verbally and telepathically. And what kind of voice did he have? Uh, I don't understand the question. Well, what did the voice, did it sound like a human voice? Was there any distinction about the voice? Um, it wasn't hard to understand him. I don't, uh... <laughs> I asked it, Bill, what, what his name was, and Bill, do you want to... He don't have... A little difficult to understand, but when everybody's used to seeing each other's minds, names and identities and ways to tell who is who go, don't go away. Uh, he was never identified by a name in front of us. He may have had one for other people in the facility, but we weren't given that information. Um, and his explanation, basically, was that when everybody communicates with their minds, when everybody's telepathic, a, there's no secrets, and B, there's no <laughs> need for verbal identity because every, you know what somebody's mind looks like. And when you see, you understand who they are, you don't need to have a name to identify people. Okay, so, but, uh, but to get back to, because people are going to want to know this, in other words, uh, it is, is said that, that greys do not speak with the same kind of voices that we have. Um, were you aware of any kind of, uh, let's say, apparatus that he might be using in order to vocalize um, naturally? He, he had on clothes. He, it was a suit, so to speak. Uh, it looked like a jumpsuit. Uh, he could have easily been wearing something, but, at the, I mean, it wasn't a normal voice, but at the same time, it wasn't hard to understand him when he talked. It was English. It was clear. Um, it was practiced. He'd been doing it for many years. Um, it was my understanding that he was a prisoner, and he was not allowed to leave, even though he would very much like to leave. Um, little bits of information that he was able to push, is a good word, into people's consciousness uh, in a manner that people would understand as if you don't really understand good English and people talk really, really, really fast, uh, you, can't under you can't understand. Uh, and he was teaching us how to talk really fast with our minds, basically. So he could push information and slip little tidbits of things that I would assume he wasn't supposed to talk about or do. Okay, and well, we, we have an interview with uh, a guy named Dan Sherman, who was trained uh, in a similar way, only first of all with the computer and later became telepathic with such a being. Um, he said the same thing. He said that they can communicate on multiple layers simultaneously. 
Would you describe yes, it that way? That, that, is a, that, is, that is a very good example of what I'm trying to describe, is that um, on one layer is this slow level of communication, and then um, once you get better at it, uh, you can push the bandwidth. You can express information at such a high speed, or speed, that's a crappy word, at such a level that uh, if you don't understand that there's these multiple levels, that it would just sound like garbage. It would sound like somebody's talking too fast and you can't understand. I, it's very difficult to explain to people how this works because you have to experience it to understand. Okay, how many people were in your class? Uh, all of us were, all nine. Uh, all nine, okay. Yeah. Uh, so all nine had a similar aptitude to the one you had. Um, we all had, we all had the ability to learn. We, we, we all picked up certain things better, you know, one of us would pick up telepathy better, and one of us would pick up remote viewing better, and one of us would pick up, uh, how do you say this? Uh, what would be interpreted as the layman as being a human lie detector, when you could sense when people were being deceptive. Um, there was a lot of things. Um, uh, one of the team members had a very good sense of being able to sense the area around him. And could expand that out into such a way that he could foresee landmines, traps. Uh, I could view detection very easily. Uh, people concentrating on my thoughts. Okay, but at some point during this training process, you must have been chosen to uh, look beyond looking glass. Were all nine of you used in that capacity, or just yourself? Oh, no, that, that was much, much later, and I do have something to say on that, but okay. um, let's finish this, and then we can move on to that. The, 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 the looking glass thing, um, since I've been here and been able to talk to people who have more knowledge than you could possibly imagine about what's been going on in the world in the past 40, 50 years, uh, have helped me enormously to understand and also helped them understand what that experience was all about and why I was chosen for that project. And Okay, are you, are you in touch with any of the nine? No, no. Um, I would assume that any of our lives would be in horrible danger if we were to even attempt to contact each other, which is why I don't talk about them. Um, I don't want to put them in any kind of possible danger because I do not believe that being able to point out who these people were would do any good except for put all of us in that much more danger. Um, okay, but putting us together would be dangerous for all of us. Okay, but in terms of uh, backing up your story and sort of standing beside you, has anyone come forward behind the scenes to you? Or would you be willing to say that? There are a handful of military personnel that have come forward to me that I very much want to talk to, um, one of which happened today, who has a large amount of information, uh, that basically told me that uh, he was able to answer and tell people about my experiences before I was expressing them in the interview. 
Uh, so and this is because there are people out there that know exactly what I was going through and have information and are willing to talk about it, but maybe not come forward with it. And yes, I talked to four, I won't be specific in the number, people that would like to talk to me and tell me the information that they have without coming forward. Um, maybe that will change, but right now uh, people are looking at my experiences and what's happening to me, and I'm pretty sure that it's easy to say that they have reason to be deathly afraid of coming out themselves. Okay. Since my life has been turned upside down and sideways and I've had to go into hiding and run away from my former life and be here just so I can be safe. Okay, uh, now there are a lot of people that have questions about the group that is giving you uh, sort of a safe place. What is it that you can say about them uh, that, that, you know, is there anything more? Uh, I believe I asked yes. you this question on the, on yeah, the live stream before. Yes, yes. Go ahead. Um, yeah, let me, let me talk about that. Um, immediately after the second interview, um, I was given the location of where I needed to go, um, and left right after that second interview uh, for this place. Um, I cannot disclose the location. I can't give much uh, information other than who's supporting me without naming names, how they're supporting me, what I'm doing here, uh, and uh, to identify that um, if you are a Camelot listener, um, somebody in the past has spoken of this place as well. And it is, I call it the place where freedom began because there is a huge concentration of absolutely amazing people here. Uh, top level people, people that have had experience in the military, in the alphabet agencies, and have gotten out, and now work behind the scenes trying to institute change. Now I will say that these people don't have much hope for humanity's ability to pull this one out, let's just put it that way. Uh, this area is highly defensible. It is... Uh, cut off from the rest of the world for the most part. Uh, it is out of the way and uh, it is its own community. It's okay, but, self but, and yep. Okay, thank you. But what about the people that are uh, that are sort of giving you this safety? Is there anything that you're able to say? In other words, um, obviously, it's valuable if there's anybody, any, any person who, especially a military person, but, but given that maybe the military people just don't, um, sorry to say, have the cojones to come forward and or, um, you know, they're, they're pressured to, to completely or, or programmed to completely to, to, to back up your story. But is there anyone in that vicinity who would back up your story and be willing to come on camera? And I have to ask, I'm assuming you're, you're going to answer my question in, in the negative. Um, you're absolutely correct. Um, the only person that might have come forward uh, had an experience a long time ago where he came forward and he definitely feels that it didn't work out well for him. Uh, the other people that are supporting me are not willing based on what has happened to me based on the attention that it has brought to what I'm doing and all the negative things that have been occurring uh, behind the scenes to try and find me to try and get to me um, they spend most of their time making sure that that doesn't happen uh, I am going to be, 
the only person that's going to be a face to what's going on right now because there's some real danger to what's going to what's happening to me. And the fact that I'm in this place is a miracle because to the world this place does not exist. Well, until and, others start coming forward, is that not until right? Others, right. I mean, that's I'm I'm the first person to come forward. He's I'm alone the in one that. that will say <laughs> that there is this place in America where people like me would be brought into to be safe and to tell their story and to know that they don't have to worry about their head exploding uh, from a sniper shot at any given time, in any given place, at any given day. Um, people around here know everybody. Everybody knows everybody. You can't come and you can't go. When I got here, I was identified four minutes after I got here, and I was asked a very specific question. Can I help you? Um, I, if I would have given the name I gave, I would have been in trouble. But I knew who I was supposed to meet, and they literally put us together instantly. Everybody knew I was coming. It's, a, it's an amazing, amazing place, and it's hard to believe that it exists, quite frankly. These people are absolutely amazing. Okay. And um, the people that are taking care of me are absolutely amazing. Okay. So I have a lot of people still asking questions, so if you don't mind, I'm going to continue. Uh, yep. a, a lot of people have uh, over and over again been asking this. <laughs> and uh, they keep referring to a Bud's question about your training. Uh, they seem to feel that Bud's is a, a class that you have to take and that there's a, some kind of a national database in which the BUDS number is not classified um, and et cetera, et cetera. How can you address that? I would say this very specifically. If you go through BUDS into a secret training or a secret program like, I don't know, the SEAL Team 9 that they all say doesn't exist, you don't get to put it on a flag and wave it around and say, this is my BUDS class. You don't get to say that instead of going through BUDS, we weren't allowed to fail BUDS. We got pushed through. We were made to graduate. Most people have a tough time graduating BUDS because you can quit at any time, and they do everything in their power to make you quit. If you survive without quitting, that's graduation. In our case, we weren't allowed that privilege. We were encouraged. We were given special instruction, which wasn't a good thing. Um, we worked very, very, very hard to get up to speed because all but one of us was not physically apt. We were all a bunch of geeks. And it was very difficult at first. And it was also very difficult because there are SILs out there that know that this team was working side by side with them and they know that it didn't exist. And that any time they asked questions about it, they were told, stop asking questions. It's a given that SEALs are taught to A, keep secrets, and B, to understand when you don't ask questions about things. Every one of them could tell you a story that would shock you. There is a handful of people out there that were going through an actual BUDS class that you can put a three-digit number on and say, this is the BUDS class that I went to through the national database. I can't do that. I'm sorry. But the world is the way it is. And yeah, if I can't say that I'm in a national database, 
I have a suggestion. It's maybe because there's really, really, really good reason for it, and maybe that reason is that I participated in a SEAL team that doesn't exist. And that's the answer. Okay, and uh, I'm also hearing that SEAL Team 6 is on that database, and I would suggest that that's because their, their um, classification was different than yours. And, uh, and, and, and that they only perhaps even may, maybe relatively recently kind of moved into a higher classification right before they were killed. But I, I think that that's uh, just my logical mind working. Would you like to answer it from your perspective? Um, uh, I love those words they say. They are a tremendous amount of information in the world. Um, I would like everybody to just go ahead and identify all of the members by their name and buds class that have ever been in SEAL Team 6. If they can do that, then I will believe that every member of SEAL Team 6 was on the National Buds Registry. Okay. Um, but I'm saying that that information will never be produced. Promise that. I hear you. I've got somebody else asking you, do you know about Marshall Island Operations Center? I'm not going to talk about that at all. Okay. That would definitely get me in a hole. Well, that person is uh, the kind of person who can ask that kind of question because he's been there uh, in, I'm speaking metaphorically. Um, mm -hmm. Okay. That's fine for me, but I'm not going to violate my confidentiality agreement. He can violate his. He can tell you all about Marshall Island. Go ahead, buddy. It's all on you. Okay. Uh, all right. Let's see. I've got some more um, some more questions, if you don't mind. Um, let's see. Uh, someone is is saying that they believe perhaps you had more than one trainer that was ET at Area 51. Is that true? If I did, how do I say this? My understanding of most aliens is that they put on a human suit when they come here. Um, they are of a different density. They just remember uh, what they knew before they come here. Uh, Day of the Earth stood still, Fiona Reeves. Easiest way to describe it to the layman. Okay, that's fair enough. Um, let me see. Uh, is I'm, I'm just curious because you had quite a reaction there. Uh, is there something associated with asking that question that brings a memory to your mind that would be um, maybe I don't know, get you in trouble for answering it? Oh, yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay. That's, that's fine. Um, that, that's as far as I can go with that answer. Um, all right. To say anything more would not be good. And it might, <laughs> it might put the safety of some of those in individuals in danger. Okay, uh, let me just ask you a few nuts and bolts questions that have been going by uh, quickly. One of the nuts and bolts questions was that you operated a box when you were on, uh, you know, those missions in your Iraq, Iraq, and there's a name for that yes. box. Are you willing to say the name of the box? Absolutely not. I'll call it the box. That's good enough. Okay. Um, I'd say if you want to see the box, go over and, uh, you know, Look at the pictures of a uh, drone operator console and try to imagine that that uh, is about the size of something that you could wear on your back and carry around and still use to operate and fly a vehicle remotely. Okay, someone uh, is asking if Keystone has a meaning for you. Keystone does have a meaning for me. Okay. Uh, um, go ahead. It isn't something that I have much information about, 
but there's a lot of things that people can that people talk about that you don't necessarily know or don't know, but you trust the people giving you the information, so you believe it. How about that? Okay, uh, there was a lot of confusion from our first interview, it seems to me, uh, in some of the listeners between Looking Glass and the Yellow Cube or Yellow Book. Uh, for people listening, Yellow Cube and Yellow Book are two names of the same thing. Looking Glass is another thing. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen our interview, Stargate Secrets with Dan Burish, uh, if you want to get more explanation on that, I encourage you to watch that interview. However, Bill, are you able to, because it sounded to me as though you had some knowledge of the Yellow Cube, although you had seen Looking Glass, you never saw it in operation. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Well, I now that I've been here and talked to a bunch of people that wanted to talk to me uh, about this subject, um, my level of understanding of what I went through has increased significantly. Um, I suspect that there are people that I've talked to that know why I was brought onto the project and have tried to help me understand it without giving me any information. Um, the difference between the yellow cube and the looking glass. The looking glass was used for the same purpose as the yellow cube. I do not believe that the looking glass was used appropriately. In the same way that you can use a wrench to hammer a nail into a board, you that's not what a wrench is used for. Yes, you can use looking glass to look into the future, but it's not what it was for. Um, I don't know how to realistically explain it to people other than that. Um, certainly if you had a better understanding of the looking glass that I now may have, may not have, since I can only operate on theories about what I evolved my understanding of looking glass into now, um, that we never used it appropriately and that's why we assume that it did what it did, but maybe it was for a whole lot more, and if we understood its more divine purpose, or its more broad scope purpose of what it did, that looking into the future would be a very primitive use of it. Okay. Well, Yellow Cube, I think that was designed to look into the future for humans to look into the future. Now, I never had any experience other than documentation with that. Okay. Uh, this, this idea of the converging timelines, however, is something that you saw when you, when you did a remote viewing and you looked beyond looking glass or beyond what looking glass was reading out to people. Is that correct? That's correct. And I'm going to kind of share a theory um, with everybody that's kind of evolved since I've been here. Um, certainly if you had a tool like looking glass and you could see into the future and you could see this wall and you wanted to prevent this thing from happening, you would obviously step back and see what caused the changes, what made it so this thing happened that you don't want to have happen. And you would try to change those events in time. Um, what I think happened was every time that they went to change something, they ended up causing a, a, po a positive to the negative or the negative to the positive, but they caused an imbalance that would inherently fix the paradox and lead to, we'll just say, timeline one. And every time they tried to make it go to timeline two, they only made it go to timeline one faster. Now realize they weren't actually doing these things. They were using the looking glass to insert these possibilities and see the paradoxes that they created. But they could never insert a possibility that created a paradox 
that led to Timeline 2. Or at least I was never given any information about that possibility. Certainly there was a lot of people that agreed that Timeline 2, that they had created a paradox that made it impossible for Timeline 2 to happen. Okay, but when you said the timelines converge, when you have a convergence, you don't eliminate one timeline. You converging, uh, you you know, because that's not the words you would use. So the words yeah, you would yeah. use, ha, ha, what it what it sounds like from the perspective of the listener is that there are two lines coming together in which ingredients from both timelines would theoretically still come into play. That it, that okay. it would be depe dependent on those particular incidents to sort of fight it out between themselves as to which would maybe happen. But ultimately, if you're talking about a convergence of timelines, and I have to say that there had to be much more than two, but I assume you're doing this that for simplification, correct. that if there are two timelines and you use the language conversion, convergence, you are talking about something that doesn't eliminate the other timeline completely at all. Um, can, you, can you kind of clarify that? Okay. Um, the thing that everybody needs to understand about future is that you have to accept and understand free will. And everybody in existence right now in this reality has free will. And every time they exercise their free will, they choose a path on their journey. And what I mean by the convergence of the timelines is that our level of understanding evolves to the point where everybody exercises their free will and chooses this one path, this timeline one path. Okay, but that's not and convergence. That is, I'm, I'm just telling you that in terms of speaking the English language, that is not that, that's not convergence. If everyone's choosing timeline one and therefore we're moving on to timeline one and off of timeline two, then that is what you need to say if that's how you saw it. And, and what I also have to ask about that is, did you see this in your remote viewing at the time, which was around, I believe, 1997, or is this something that in later years you looked back and added on? Okay. Let me just lay it out there for you because it's a little hard to understand. But with Looking Glass, if you've gotten, gotten all these scientific opinions and you've gotten all these PhD physicists and, and uh, philosophers and everybody to look at this problem, everybody's asked me the same question. I'm sure people have asked themselves this question. Why the hell would they bring me in at the very end to try to figure this problem out. And there is a theory that's getting kicked around right now that if you knew that there was a catalyzing effect that changed everything and made this evolution of consciousness occur so that it happened no matter what you did to try and change it. And this evolution of consciousness is timeline one. The lack of, ed of this evolution of consciousness would be timeline two. Why would you call somebody like me in and try to get me to fix everything that hundreds of smarter people have already determined couldn't be done? And there is a theory kind of floating around out there, and it's kind of the only thing that makes sense to me now, is that if you got really, really, really desperate, and you had access to somebody that may be a part of the catalyzing effect, if you could literally call this guy in and get him to undo his own future... Ahead of time. Ahead of time. Maybe that would work. Um, I can only speak to this for one reason and one reason only. When I was working on this thing, everybody that I talked to, everybody that gave me things, and the way that the information was given me, given to me, and 
the fact that I don't believe I was given the information, the support, and the ability to properly solve this problem may have been because they were desperately trying to keep some information from me that if I would have known about, there would have been no way in hell that I would have helped them. And that's basically what it comes down to, okay. is that uh, I don't think I was given good information when I was using the information that I was given to investigate <laughs> the timelines because I theorize and many other people theorize that I am somehow directly involved in this catalyzing effect that guarantees timeline one to happen. Okay. Uh, now I appreciate that. What but, can I say? But the trouble, <laughs> but 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 just to back up to the experience that you originally talked about, what you talked mm -hmm. about was being brought in to see beyond looking glass. There was no mention yeah. of fixing a problem. In other words, you. You're, well, you're now talking. In. You're now talking about it as if you were brought in to do something, rather than to view something. Well, you understand? I there's a difference. Brought in, I was brought in to try and trump, and I, I, I've said this many times, to trump all of the opinions of these people and try to figure out a way to come up with an alternate theory or an alternate solution. And yes, I use my abilities my intuitive problem-solving abilities, and my, if you want to call it remote viewing, call it remote viewing, but I don't see it that way, abilities to try and figure out how to offer a solution for a desired result. And that desired result First, in my opinion was timeline two to come about. Didn't you say first it was to analyze the data and then whether identify if it was correct or not correct? Well, I was, or... yes, I was called in to analyze the data to use my abilities to try to come up with an altern alternative theory. An alternative theory um, to what? I can only as to what everybody else said was going to happen. Which was? Which is this inevitable convergence of the timelines. Okay, but it where wasn't a everything convergence. Everything comes together and time stops. Okay, but you just said that what because it wasn't a convergence. What you said was everyone and no, the looking said glass a said, a, said again and again that timeline one. I say the convergence, Carrie. The timeline one. You were saying timeline one was taking precedence, were you not? So you were brought in to tell them how timeline one would not take precedence. Is that not the case? No, 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 no. No. I was you, called You were in. told at the time, were you? No, this is... I'm using timeline one and timeline two to describe it to the people that I'm talking to. There is no such words when I was doing this investigation of Timeline 1 and Timeline 2, okay. there was only this one inevitable conclusion that everybody else has come up with. That I will identify as Timeline 1 because it helps everybody to understand what I'm talking about. Okay, but were and you... Let's, let's back up. I'm sorry, but I am controlling this interview for a purpose. Um, okay. You were told what? If you weren't told were you told a conclusion, maybe not described as pro timeline one, but you were brought in, you were asked to do a job. What was the job you were asked to do so that we, the listener, can understand from your perspective back then, not, not what you see it as now, but what you were told okay. then that allowed you to reach a certain conclusion? What were you asked to do? I was, I was asked to determine if I could figure out an alternative conclusion to what everybody else was saying. And what everybody else was saying, what did not. they classify it as? Did they call it, if they didn't call it timeline one, did, what did they call it? The convergence of the timelines. Okay, and uh, that's interesting because, again, your interpretation of those words 
seems not to be what a convergence is. You just described a jumping to timeline one, not a convergence. No, 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 no. no. I'm saying that all of the choices lead to one point in the future. No matter what we choose as our free will, that it all leads to this inevitable conclusion that we experience in the future. And that the reason that Looking Glass couldn't be used any further past that point is because the only way to describe it is time ceases to exist at that point or free will make <laughs> free will becomes such that nobody would ever make a different choice in time because we have this level of understanding that we achieve that makes it so the choice between good and evil goes away to make it really, really, really simple. And okay. we would only the choose absence good. Of duality? The absence of duality is another is a perfect way to put it. Okay. Now what I'm I, I guess I'm trying to get at though, in, in terms of the, the art orders you were given and the understanding at the time that they kind of had. Can mm -hmm. you appreciate that? What I'm trying to get yeah, at yeah. here is that they brought you in and you were uh, a little while ago talking about how you were supposed to fix something and now you're talking about how they had a conclusion and the conclusion was about a sort of a convergence but the convergence is more like a merging of realities such that only one choice becomes evident and that's all by free will and I appreciate mm -hmm. that but but there is a sort of a it's not a, an obvious contradiction, but there's an implied contradiction in bringing you in and just asking you to see what you come up with, right? And you come up with, by default, the same conclusion that they've been getting over and over and over again, which is what seems to have happened. Correct? No. I was asked to come up with an alternative conclusion. But you were unable would... to do so. Is that not true? This is true. Okay. So, in other words, you didn't you didn't fix anything. You you were not you were not told to fix anything. There's you use this word fix. Well, it, because it, it's, it's it's a more, much more active verb. You were asked to look at something and see if you could see something in the future that existed differently. And perhaps you're using the word fix. It's a much more active verb. Right. Um, so all I'm trying to do is, is drill down to what your job was and, and what you came up with. And basically, what your job was, it was to see something different and you were not able to do so. Correct? Yes. Yes. And my interpretation of it now, based on the amount of knowledge that is out there uh, and the understanding that people now have of Looking Glass is that there's people in this world that don't want to see Timeline 1 happen because they rule the world right now. They're in charge. They have everything. We uh, I think live stream is continuing in, in spite of the fact that uh, what has happened okay. is, is is not that live stream is quitting on us, but that uh, Skype is being interrupted, um, and it's easy for them to do that to Skype. It's not easy for them to do that to live stream. Okay, and I appreciate your patience, uh, both of you, with this process. I, I, um, I know it can be very uh, aggravating in this in this way that we're trying to t kind of make some progress here. But I'm also reading questions well, as we go. And I'm trying yeah. to clarify for the listeners in a certain way, and it's amazing, but individuals actually think they can call me <laughs> at this time, <laughs> and that I'll answer their calls. So let me let me say a couple things right now about this process. I am not going to answer any phone calls, so you're not coming on the air with with the three of us. So don't even try. Um, now, if you're having a problem with this interview, then I suggest you go elsewhere. Uh, if you want to participate, you are welcome to ask a question. 
There's no reason to badmouth individuals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, on the chat, uh, we see what you're doing and we're just not interested. Now, okay, so I'm getting some interesting questions and I need to, let's uh, say your statement that you cut up, were cut off from Bill because uh, it, it's interesting now that your video is having some trouble uh, coming together but at any rate, I think people can see you at least to some degree. We can certainly hear you. Would you please okay. say the, the sentence you had said right when they cut, us, cut you off? Right. Okay. Um, I was talking about how there, right now, is people in charge of the world. It is a handful of people. And the rest of us are slaves. And it is their dogged determination to keep this going. They also know that there is this point in the future where this no longer exists. They won't be in charge anymore. Everybody changes. And they have to suffer the consequences of their actions. And they will do anything to prevent that, including calling me in and asking me if I can see a way out of this for them. Everybody else couldn't see a way out of this for them. I couldn't see a way out of this for them. They're screwed. <laughs> I'm sorry to tell them, but it's but, over. I have but, figured out what I need to know that I have every confidence in my viewing, in what I've seen as the future, to know, <laughs> seriously, or talking? <laughs> they're getting excited. You know, and I don't think they're screwed. This is the thing I, I Bill and I had a conversation in regards to holographics. And, okay, so in the absence of duality, what do we get? Well, we get an understanding that in nature, both sides are always present, right? And so we actually have to respect that handful of people and the dedication and the diligence that they came to this planet and embodied and made a covenant with humanity on in order to force the issue of consciousness evolving. And the information set is inherent in us, in the micro and in the macro. So we all are equally um, able to celebrate this happening. And that's what Bill has done. And that's, he's came forward as somebody on behalf of humanity, you know, and already has, through his thoughts and his conversations, transformed a huge component of this information set that is now rippling out, and it's happened, and so we have to celebrate all of us, and, and they're not screwed, actually, right, because they, too, transform, they're, they experience transformation. Okay, um, now I'm going to continue. They have created a polarization that has made it possible for us to evolve our constitution, our, our consciousness. I know it's hard to see right now that what they did and this driving apart of the opposites is what is what is showing us now that the opposite, the, the, the solution to this problem is to bring the opposites together and balance things. And even though it is a very fearful, fearful thing for the elite. Both sides. Both sides. Um, for both sides. Yes, I'm experiencing it on the good guy side too. Um, and it is a that goes very back to your hard speech. thing for everybody to accept that we all do have to come together. We all have to balance the equation. That's the secret. That's okay. what really needs to happen. That's what's going to happen. And that balance is what's occurring right now in life. Everybody's starting to realize we do need this balance. This coming together is happening. It's going to be, when, it all, when it's all said and done, everybody's going to be forgiven because everybody does share some guilt in this process. And everybody does share some innocence in this process. But and this that goes back to your Trent, um, Thomas Jefferson quote. Yes. Um, most people misinterpret uh, the Tree of Liberty speech. 
they only hear the last two lines of that speech because that's all that's said, which is uh, the blood of faith, uh, uh, the tree of liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants, for it is in its natural manure. But if you know what that quote was, and you know where it came from, it came from a letter that Thomas Jefferson wrote about the Boston Tea Party. And what he was talking about was how the British were using the Boston Tea Party as an excuse to come in and create a war to, to change us and force the uh, colonists back under British rule. And he identified the Boston Tea Party as this event that people got angry and they acted out, but it, the, the reaction to that event was way overblown, basically. And he uses the words, uh, uh, oh, I just had it in my head. Uh, oh, I need to pull the speech out. Uh, did, <laughs> uh, what is it? Pardon and pacify. Pardon and pacify. We need to pardon and pacify this lack of reality that exists in the world right now. And to these people that we see as these ultimate monsters, Eventually, you're going to see them as just our brothers and sisters that need just as much forgiveness as we do. And when that happens, things go really, really, really fast. Okay. Uh, you know, we've been going uh, for about, it's, it looks like two hours, I think, maybe two and a half, depending yeah, yeah. on how you, how you stretch it. Um, I have a few more questions to run through, and uh, it's it's really your choice uh, how long we go on uh, at this moment because uh, we can go for at least one more half hour if you're if you're willing, uh, and I will continue to run down the questions. Um, yeah, and we should we should go on as long as we can. I would love to get out as much as I could possibly get out. Okay. So a person uh, is, is asking something about three days of darkness. Were you given any of that information about three days of darkness? No. Okay. And uh, another person is asking, uh, let's see. Um, what makes you think? that they didn't already solve the problem you were sort of hired to do, in other words, or see beyond. Uh, what makes you think, uh, I guess, their implication there is that they might have been deceiving you? Um, based on what I've learned since I've been here and what I can still see as this inevitability still exists. Everybody's reaction speaks to the hopelessness that is out there that this inevitability is going to take place. Um, certainly, it's very easy to see that uh, people are trying to instill more and more fear in the, the general population and it's becoming less and less effective. Um, I have some very good evidence that hope and that this love and this lack of fear is growing. And it's not only growing, it's growing exponentially. And people are just simply understanding that the only way out of this is to really understand what I've been trying to teach everybody, and it's we create what we believe. When more and more people refuse to believe in fear, which is what has been put on us, this lack of reality to make us choose fear, and people just put all that aside and say, you know what, I'm just going to have hope. Well, that hope is changing everything. Their, 
this little donation button thing, this little experiment that I've been using to show the good guy's side of <laughs> where I'm at right now, that they can stop building bunkers and stop piloting ammunition. Because they believe it too. Um, is, is growing. And beyond growing, it's surprising most people about, it's shocking to know how many people are out there right now that are willing to just accept that they do, in fact, create what they believe. And if they believe in hope, hope is what is created. Okay. And, uh, well, I, you know, actually, I, I appreciate that. But Creating hope is uh, is sort of a um, it's almost an oxymoron. It's it's it, it it doesn't actually. In other words, creating the positive or creating the openness for a positive future is one thing. People have had hope uh, throughout history, and that's done uh, little for the future. Uh, but that's not what we're really talking about. Hope is almost a really. I mean, we may be talking about semantics here, but the, using the word hope. It, it, it verges into a religious diatribe uh, that, that is not going to really help people. Um, now, at the moment... I disagree, Terry. I, I didn't okay. okay, fine. I 100% disagree with that. Yeah, conclusion. this is something no that a lot of preachers have been saying in churches for God knows how long. Okay, so me, having hope is not what it's about. Doing constructive good is something else. I understand that. Let me offer my opinions as to why I say I disagree. It's because fear has been constructed and engineered in this world for so long. We get spun up over weapons of mass destruction. And that belief that we were all given about weapons of mass destruction enabled people to lead us into the war in Iraq. Now we know that, that we were lied to and that that fear was what created, that allowed them to control us and get us to accept that we needed to go into Iraq. It, fear is very much controlled in this world. So if, we, if, if people give up fear and turn and go the opposite direction, the opposite will occur. And it's psychology and science more than its religion. Okay, but, well, we could sort of talk all day about the philosophic uh, choice of words, but let's move on. Uh, there is somebody asking if you know about Cycles Cross. I don't understand those words, no. Okay, not sure why they're using that particular terminology. Uh, uh, I, if, if it's kind of cyclical, then yes, I understand what that is. Okay, we'll have to wait and see if another question comes along. Uh, somebody is asking um, where you think you'll be in 2025. I don't think that we have any concept of what life will be like in 2025 because Life is going to change so much in the next six months that we don't have any concept of what life is going to be like in the next six months. Okay. Uh, someone is asking about the pole shift. Is it uh, your understanding? Uh, well, let's say this, and, and let me take that question and ex expand it slightly. To have you seen or were you given things because you have emphasized that Timeline 1 contained this uh, sort of uh, anomalous event horizon that the other timeline did not. However, did you see other events within timeline one, or did you just simply see this event horizon? Let me address that question with every other cataclysmic scenario question that there is, including the three days of darkness and everything else. Anything that is fear-based, that is trying to lead you into fear, is the illusion. It's something that is trying to be engineered by people who know what's happening. And they're just trying to create fear. So I would say the answer to any question 
that is fear-based, that is creating fear inside the person asking it, that it is an illusion, it is a deception, and it will, will not occur. That's, that's the easy way for me to explain all that. Okay. Someone is asking, pertaining to 2025, they're saying that it might have been part of your earlier training uh, to look at the year, I don't know, 2025. Was that possible? Did, what, did that happen? Yeah. No. Um, 2025 is not any important year to me or in my experience with any kind of important year. Okay, um, the, the other people that were in your group, were, the, do you, were they asked to do the same thing you were asked to do? Do you happen to know? Uh, in the, of the nine, were the nine, each one of the nine asked to look beyond looking glass? It is, it is my understanding that I was the only one that was brought in for that project, yeah. Uh, all right. So I am. I'm. I'm actually looking to see if there's any other um, questions that have not been answered or have been sort of overlooked here. Um, if if you have more questions, please help Tommy by pasting them, uh, making them accessible to Tommy in the chat. Because again, um, at least they are not. They are coming by too quickly for me to read in the. Uh, it to actually look at the live stream. I'm trying to kind of grab them, but what it does is slip beyond me. <laughs> um, uh, okay, do, do you happen to have any focus on these months before that date? In other words, you obviously, or it seems to be, that you obviously looked at December 21st, 2012. That, that seems to be a, a focus or have been a focus and correct me if I'm wrong, but that's what it sounded like from your interview with me originally. Did there, you also see these months up going up to 2012, uh, December um, 21st? Yes and yes. December 21st is significant because the scientific fact that uh, our solar system crosses the galactic plane. It, it's just it. Okay, but so, was yeah, that, that was that in thing. your was that back then? Because I'm trying to put you back then oh, yeah. with these yeah. questions. Were you told, yeah. uh, you know, look at this date, for example? Remote view that date? No. My understanding of that date is that it is a scientific principle and fact that we that that day is the day that we cross the galactic plane, just like. Um, equinoxes and solstices happen. Okay, and were you aware of that fact before, uh, back in when you were told to do this remote viewing job of, of looking beyond looking glass? Oh yeah, it just, it, it, it's significant, but it didn't have anything to do with looking glass, it had to do with the evolution of consciousness. And you were told that? That was the summation of many, many, many people, yes. Okay, so th then the question was, do you, were you also asked to look to the months prior to that date? Yes, ironically enough, and this is definitely something I wanted to talk about. Um, right now, we are in a time where we have a scarcity of resources or we believe in a scarcity of resources. Um, very soon, and I can see how this would happen, um, that illusion will disappear, and resources become abundant. Um, certainly it is very possible right now, scientifically speaking, in the world to show that resources shouldn't be scarce. That we could produce and engineer technology that we know exists right now today. Maybe it isn't public knowledge and suppressed, but we know that there is many, many inventions that have been created that uh, machines that create more electricity than they use. Uh, there is a one megawatt 
fusion or cold fusion generator that has been built and tested. Cold fusion is not bullshit, in other words. We can continue to industrially construct these machines that will produce an abundance of resources. Everybody will have enough food. Everybody will have enough electricity. Everybody will have enough water. Right. We'll we, have, we understand. Okay, mean, they understand what it means. Could you tell me, is this something you saw during these months prior to, t to the 21st of December? Oh, yes. It turns very utopian. Yes. Okay, so in the months prior to December 21st. Yes, 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 yes. That's what okay. causes the evolution of consciousness is people getting away from the fear of the scarcity of resources. Okay, fine. Because it doesn't exist anymore. Okay. And if you give me two seconds to see if I can pop something open. Uh, Apologies. Go ahead and talk and I'll find All right. Uh, along those lines, uh, someone was asking because you, one of the things that you'd said in the, in the thing that I, I posted, which was a, like a short um, preamble to this event, you had said that there would be things that would blow people's mind in this particular event. Um, they were basically asking, what were you referring to? Hold on just one second and I'll give you the website that will show exactly what I'm talking about. Okay, website. K-E-S-H-E space dot com. Go ahead and take a look at that website. Um, that will show you the future of technology. That okay. is a good example of the technology that currently exists that we all should be having access and using, that the government has, and the elites, have suppressed to keep us under control. Um, there is technology that exists out there that will blow people's minds. Okay, I we believe that that's been posted on my blog. I believe that's the Ira Iranian uh, physicist, his website. Okay, I buy that. Um, but it's not because it's an Iranian physicist that I'm showing it. Sure, of it's course. Because that is a good example of a conglomeration of all the technologies that he is basically pointing out to say, hey, this all exists, all you got to do is build. And right. Okay, so at if this we went into Area 51 and saw what exists over there, we would know for a fact that we are that we are dependent on petrochemicals because we are not being given enough information to know that we have the power to change it. We yes. are being dependent on GMO foods because we aren't giving them, being given enough information on how to change it. Um, one of the people that I am here with right now, um, <laughs> little quick story, uh, her. Stepfather, who was an ex Navy SEAL, uh, back in the days, ex Navy SEALs got together and worked on this kind of technology. Um, she, from her childhood, did a large amount of investigation through these ex Navy SEALs about pyramid work and how what pyramids do and how they work and that they work and that they can be used for different purposes. That is a very, not quintessential, but it is a wonderful example of how much we don't know. Um, okay. We, we need to, we will be figuring out that this massive amount of technology is on the horizon, it's going to happen, and that's the next step, is to bring the technology to the forefront, start producing it, start manufacturing it, start accepting it as reality, and stop letting our government and the elites keep it out of our lives. Okay, I appreciate and that. that. Uh, everything this, we need. Yeah, and, and again, this uh, Camelot audience is very, very aware of that, and, and but thank you for, for speaking to that. Um, what I'm being asked, though, is that you said that 
You know, it's important uh, in, in a Camelot interview that we don't make promises that we can't keep and uh, in, in advance. And so you did say that there was going to be information that would blow people's minds. Were you referring to something specific? Um, everything that I put out, if it doesn't change people's understanding just a little bit, then I don't know what to say. Um, if the fact that, you know, the world, I mean, there's people right now, and more than you could possibly imagine, actively working on making this world perfect, but certainly much, much, much better. Certainly, this time next year, we won't be using gasoline to get around. Certainly, this time next year, we won't be using even electricity. Electricity is an archaic concept that we will be eliminating. There is people that I'm speaking to right now that have this understanding and this bold vision of the future that are actively producing it. Yes, uh, Brian, Brian O'Leary, ex-astronaut who just passed on, went around the world investigating this and, and inter interviewing free energy uh, uh, activists and inventors and we have uh, uh, brought forward his testimony in that regard so he's written a book about that so that information is out there and uh, and it is very important there's no doubt about it was there anything else that you saw uh, let's get very specific about the United States uh, did you see anything specific when you looked into the timeline between the months of this February and uh, December 21st 2012 that had to do with the U.S. government? Well, yeah. Um, it's very easy to see, and, well, not to see, to explain that most people in this country, no, not Camelot viewers, but most people in this country, when asked what kind of government we have, they would say democracy. But that's not the kind of government we're supposed to have. It's country is based on being a republic. The republic will return. Um, Stephen Jobs, before he died, left us with a magical piece of technology of uh, facial recognition. We don't need representatives to make decisions anymore. We can easily move into the future where the people make the decisions. The people do the voting and have the direct vote, and we don't put the hands of, or the, uh, we don't put our government in the hands of a few people that we choose to represent. Uh, okay, but that's actually that not answering the question, so I just want to get more specific. Specifically, not what we will be doing, but what will happen between this month and tw the 21st of December, you say, this country will become a republic, uh, it sounds like. How will it do so? Are you talking about a, a civil war? Are you talking about everyone's going to sit down at a round table and agree to, to turn this into a republic? I mean, I'm asking whether you have seen anything specific in ter terms of events that you can speak to. Once again, the people are waking up. They are seeing what changes need to take place to make things the way they're supposed to be. One of these changes that is necessary and needs to take place and will take place because people are going to decide that's what it has to be is that this deception that our government is a democracy is melting away. Is it a revolution? Kind of. It's a revolution in the fact that enough people are finally going to get together and stand up and change things. Okay. Um, now, I no have... No longer are people going to accept the status quo. 
but it's changing. It's already changing. If you knew what I knew, and you had the access to the resources that I've been given access to, you can see the changes. Um, okay, and yes, that's I am good. looking actively to participate and get everybody else to participate in the changes to bring about the fact that we don't need our government anymore to make decisions for us. We can do that on our own. Okay. We can I, make our own decisions for society. Okay, I appreciate that. Okay, uh, now I have people that are asking about the channeling that you were involved in. Uh, when I interviewed you, I was not aware that you were involved in channeling. Um, not sure how long. Do you want to talk about that at all? Um, long before uh, I got involved in this, um, I was involved in uh, the much more spiritual side of the house, I guess, is the way to put it. Um, there's people out there that, like scientists that approach this subject from the scientific point of view, other people approach this from the opposite direction, from the spiritual side. And Either way you go, the evolution of consciousness is what's occurring. Um, the people that I best connected with a um, year and a half ago were people that call themselves light workers or light warriors. And there is a lot of people that understand that our spirit or our soul is the most important part of us and they tend to focus on that and that they accept and understand that there is beings out there that would love to help us that are like our spirit in the fact that they are of a higher density or a higher plane of existence or something that is completely above our understanding right now. Multidimensional. And multidimensional. That's a very good word. Um, what we would call aliens, they just call the other beings in the galaxy. And yes, I do believe that what we are about to achieve is so monumental and so unique in the universe that the universe is now looking at Earth and watching it happen. And I will describe it the way that I've described it in that spiritual world as we are beginning to emerge from this cocoon that we've created of illusion. And as that illusion falls away, this beautiful race of beings is going to emerge from it. Um, we aren't going to be who we are right now. And I won't even begin to try to get people to understand what a huge thing that is going to be. Okay, well, I, you know, at this moment, I have to say that there's no need, you know, you, there's no need to condescend to the audience. So let's, no, 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 no. let's understand, let's understand that these people have a very vast knowledge of other beings and some of them may even be in the group that you're participating in. So before we, I just don't want you to go into that land where you're basically well, going to tell them things that they have no idea about. They understand they have, we have contactees, probably every single person involved here is multidimensional, first of all, they know that as mm -hmm. a fact, and they mm -hmm. also know that they are, uh, they are themselves quite possibly channeling, and they also know that there are different groups and there's also a programming surrounding this planet of channeling that is going around and around like uh, so much refuge refuse and uh, basically can can basically be thrown exactly where you throw that kind of stuff so what I want to do here is I appreciate that you have been channeling and I am making no sort of um, oh I never said I was channeling I said I was involved with channelers I see. I 
Okay, so yeah. so that's I guess people would just want some kind of clarification specifically, not based on something that you will tell them about the world, but basically what is your experience? Uh, are you basically saying that that is a particular group that you agree with those particular channelers and that's why you've been involved with them? You yourself have not been channeling, is that what you're saying? Let me say this, Terry, and this is kind of important for her. It was an important thing for me to understand. How about this? Um, I believe it was Albert Einstein that said, the only true knowledge is the knowledge that you understand nothing. And when you say nothing, I also clarify it as nothing in comparison to what is out there to be known. We think we know a lot, but in all reality, we don't know anything in comparison to true knowledge. So what I'm trying to convey to people, and what has drawn me to this spiritual side of the house, is the best way to address knowledge right now is to give ourselves the understanding that we really don't know. And if we can empty ourselves and become a vessel, maybe something will come in and fill us up with that true knowledge. And that's what I... That's kind of the understanding that I have right now. Is the best thing to do is accept that we don't know what's happening. If well, we can accept to, that we don't know what's happening, maybe we'll get the answers. But as long as you for believe the, something, it won't come. Past few days, Bill, I related to what David Wilcox talks about with the raspberry and the yeah. um, superimposition of, of uh, perfect raspberry vibrationally onto an imperfect raspberry and how it develops. And so what I'm learning from Bill and what I'm hearing, I could be wrong, is that in in potential we are these imperfect because of, you know, like Stur 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 talks about the channeling in Montauk and how that was pervasive and some may or may not be correct. Um, so right now we may, may be these imperfect raspberries uh, based on this um, quantum physics that this Russian study uh, scientist did, if you if you can remove the fear, get into a place where you can visualize your full potential, and then act as if like that raspberry superimpose that full potential actual self onto yourself. Call it channeling, whatever you want. Then view the world through that um, multi-dimensional being then you have access to the information sets beyond your personal consciousness. And that's kind of what I think Bill's been able to do even with his mind control blocks that he's had. And a lot of times when he, people are asking him questions, Carrie, yourself included, it seems like he's, it's because he's having to channel, he's got to go outside of that blackness to get some answer and that's just my personal experience of watching it but if we could all go to a place where we ab get out of the fear get out of the duality get out of feelings get out of thinking and like you said get to that place of uh, creating space to then have a multi-dimensional version superimposed onto us then like that raspberry we can become a better quality version of what's possible, transform into potential. That was okay. a beautiful explanation, thank you. All right, so at this point, uh, simply because the, the questions are sort of becoming repetitive and uh, we've been going for quite some time, actually, uh, and, and so I'm gonna shut this down. Uh, we will obviously put this up for people to listen to the entire thing on on live stream it, it tends to uh, actually do that very quickly so I encourage you to ask others if they're interested to to tune in and and listen um, you are certainly welcome to go out and do some things more in the future uh, that would sort of publish your philosophies etc in another venue uh, I, I apologize that this particular format in terms of Camelot is, is, is sort of a little bit more structured
then perhaps you, either of you would have uh, preferred, and, and I apologize for that. But I think that you did get mm -hmm. some very important points across, and I want to thank both of you for your, your patience and understanding, uh, patience with the audience, with their questions, with myself and my questions. Um, you know, there is a, a method to this madness, so to speak, yeah. and that we're all involved in, and ultimately, hopefully, we'll have a, a wonderful um, sort of resolution. And indeed, uh, we will look towards the future for some anomalous events. And I've got people <laughs> calling me here, thinking that whatever. Uh, but but basically, we are going to wind this down now, and, and I will thank both of you. Um, I will give you Bill specifically because this was aimed at you and this was your format or forum to, to talk to people. If there's any last words you'd like to say to the audience before we sign off, go right ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to say this. Um, I think that right now is a very, very important time. Um, and I think that people should start focusing on what he has said and focusing on their full potential and realizing that we do have the ability to be this amazing, creative, perfect world if we choose it. And it's simply a free will choice. If we want this change, if we want this perfect world, if we want to see the things happen that we see in our hearts, we need to walk away from imagining anything but that. And once we can create that world in our minds, I think we can share quickly that we can make free will choice to create what we truly, truly believe in and walk away from the fear-based scenarios that exist simply because somebody else instills them into us. So yes, thank you, Carrie. I very much appreciate all the time that you've given me. And once again, uh, I, I, I wish you luck on what you're doing. And I know that what you do is so important to the work that everybody is doing right now. And I know that in the future you will be able to give people more of what they need and continue to put the information out there and make it so these cataclysmic scenarios do not occur because they can't occur if we know about them ahead of time. They can't blow up the USS Enterprise if we all know that they're going to try to blow up the USS Enterprise. So let's get that information out there and understand that once people like Harry put it out there, it can occur, because if it does occur, we will know that they did it and why they did it. So thank you. All right. All right. Thank you very much, Eva, and thank you, Bill. And good night, everyone. Uh, thanks a lot for listening. And thank you, Carrie, so much. Okay. Take care. Good night. Hi there, this is Carrie Cassidy from Project Camelot and we are going live on live stream with Bill Brockbrader and Eva Moore. In the background is a song that someone has written. Bill, do you want to give that person any kind of uh, attribute or anything? Uh, yeah, let me uh, pull that up. Uh, I wanted to uh, thank uh, Craig Bashirs uh, for creating that song. Uh, 
He uh, sent that to me today, and I listened to the words, and I absolutely love what it says. So thank you, Greg. Great. Okay. What's going on is is that we are going to be doing a second follow-up interview here with Bill Brockbrader, a.k.a. Bill Wood. Um, he came out under an assumed name initially to protect himself and his, uh, well, close family, etc. And uh, he knew that eventually he would be discovered on the internet, as, as sure enough did happen, but it gave him a little leeway in the, in the beginning, um, sort of, as it happened, he needed that leeway, um, and he's going to explain why. At this mo moment, I'm going to just let Bill Brockbrader go ahead. Uh, the first thing we're going to address is um, the questions from the Navy SEALs in regard to his training, and uh, he's going to say whatever he is allowed to say or whatever he feels comfortable saying that keeps him um, safe and, and keeps him within his classified status uh, without breaking that, I guess. So go ahead, Bill. Um, the first thing uh, that I need to say about all the questions that are coming out from the Navy SEALs and all the uh, answers that they want as far as my training background and what I've done is that they understand that they are bound by the same confidentiality agreement that they signed that I signed. And to explain to the layman what a confidentiality agreement is, is if you uh, discuss any uh, classified or top secret information that uh, you acquired in your time in service, uh, uh, the description that I've been given is that they will throw you in a hole and then they, were th they will throw away the hole. And uh, I think everybody understands that those prisons do exist, that there are some prisoners in this country that nobody knows about and they are in these places, that these prisons that don't exist. Um, I desperately do not want to get put in one, um, so I will abstain from being led into the trap that the Navy SEALs want me to discuss and uh, reveal my training and background and uh, what I have done in my time of service. And uh, I do apologize for that, but there is uh, some security issues that uh, I have been dealing with lately that are very, very real. Um, certainly, I could uh, point to the fact that uh, my true identity uh, was found and outed almost immediately after the interview. Um, Carrie can speak to uh, some uh, people that uh, have uh, directly gone after her and me very openly. Uh, one of which is a former Navy SEAL that uh, runs a very uh, informational website and uh, obviously he spends a lot of time and effort on, but uh, I believe it also uh, indicates that he does have some uh, government ties and he is involved in the information or disinformation game about uh, Navy SEALs and keeping their uh, secrets a secret. Uh, there was also uh, another gentleman that uh, is involved in a very, uh, obviously, high-powered, uh, I would call it, uh, private investigations company, but it also appears to be a very special investigations company. And uh, those two gentlemen uh, have been making Carrie and uh, my life miserable. And uh, that is the primary reason why the information has come out. Now, since uh, the Navy SEALs have asked me some questions, I would like to ask them two questions. And maybe this would help people understand uh, what's really going on in the world right now. Um, Senior Chief Shipley, Don Shipley, is the former Navy SEAL that's uh, been going after me. He's uh, been making some very broad statements on the internet and calling me a liar and uh, saying that SEAL Team 9 doesn't exist. Um, and uh, he's been providing a lot of information that I would challenge as, how would he know? Um, certainly, I don't think Senior Chief Shipley has access to every black project ever created in the military, every secret uh, uh, military team ever created in the military. So I'm going to ask Senior Chief Shipley this one thing. If he could address this, then um, I think everybody will completely understand where I'm coming from. Um, if SEAL Team 9 doesn't exist, 
why doesn't it exist? Why did they skip the number nine when they created SEAL teams? Um, everybody's very well aware that up until very recently, like last year, end of last year, SEAL Team 6 didn't exist either. And the same information would have come out. Deny, deny, deny. Everybody would have said SEAL Team 6 doesn't exist. And, you know, these guys are a bunch of liars if they say it does. But we found out different. Over time, the truth came out. Uh, they used that information to uh, create a nice little publicity campaign and, you know, tout that we killed Osama bin Laden. Yay, America. Um, but I don't think America or in our government has a very good track record of telling us the truth. And that's what we're really trying to talk about today, is the truth. Um, certainly there's mountains of information from uh, what I call the Department of Disinformation. And they're working feverishly. A uh, few hours uh, after I woke up this morning, I was getting dozens of emails asking why the show had been canceled. I didn't know why the show had been canceled, but information has been put out there that the show was canceled, and I found that very interesting. It's, and I know Carrie will back me up on this, there has been a massive amount of pressure on her to not let this show go through, and she has been doggedly determined to make sure it happens, so we need to uh, thank Carrie for putting her butt on the line just as much as I'm putting my butt on the line. For so, years. Carrie, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I would thank also you. like to ask uh, one more question to the SEAL teams, and uh, everybody that uh, is uh, not in the military or still in the military, there is no such thing as an ex-Navy SEAL. You are always an ex you are always a Navy SEAL if you are a Navy SEAL. Um, my question is, why aren't you guys doing what I'm doing? Why is it up to me? Why aren't you obeying your oaths? You swore to protect and defend this Constitution of the United States of America against all enemies, foreign and domestic, just as I did. Nobody will deny we both took that oath. So why is, is it up to me? Why is it up to me? Why aren't you guys stepping up? Why aren't you doing your jobs? If you're the true Navy SEALs, why is it the fake Navy SEAL, according to you, is doing all the hard work <laughs> and standing up and being a leader and trying to help people understand the truth about this country? Because I know all of you have information that this country needs to understand that there's things going on that the average citizen has no idea about the war effort and what we do to create war, what we do to create terrorism. National security is a threat because we create the threat and every one of you knows it. And every one of you could stand up and say something that supported my message and fix this country and you haven't done it. So answer those two questions. Why no SEAL Team 9 and why aren't you helping fix this country? Because you know it's broken. Thank you, Perry. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you very much, Bill. Uh, I appreciate that statement uh, very much. And I, I agree, we have been a, uh, under a lot of pressure. Um, in fact, I have uh, uh, gotten in touch with a lawyer to, to give me some guidance in terms of, because I am an investigative journalist and I needed to know what my rights are under these circumstances. Um, tonight, during this broadcast, Bill Brock Brader, a.k.a. Bill Wood, may say some things or name some names that I am not um, aware of, you know, in advance, uh, as, as did happen in the interview, simply because that's not how we operate. I do, do not vet the information before we release it. This is a live broadcast in which I will ask questions, uh, Bill Wood, in, in this world. And I come forward today as a civilian, um, just an everyday average person who has followed a golden thread of information that led to another packet of information and then folded into another packet of information set and um, that led to Bill. And um, when he came forward, I had just recently uh, somehow stumbled upon Kay Griggs' interview with Reverend Strawcutter, 
in um, 1998, I think it was the original date. And Kay Griggs was a phenomenal role model for me. Um, if I were to back up, I'd say, you know, through my own personal experiences, I've sought out strong females. And um, I'd say Naomi Wolf was a, probably the first person that uh, brought me forward into understanding what was happening in the United States in her End of America documentary, where she documents systematically uh, for listeners um, or viewers uh, to really understand um, uh, what the steps are and they're a blueprint and she organized them for people to be able to really um, have a primer I guess as she calls it uh, to understand this is what a would-be despot would do to destabilize a country. Um, so then, you know, that set the tone for me to really be present to what's unfolding in our, in our current um, situation globally. And um, Kay Griggs, anyways, Kay Griggs, I stumbled upon her not too long ago, and I see this fierce woman come forward with such a brave heart, and I just want to thank her on behalf of all military personnel, um, she came forward in 1998 on behalf of all of these people and had the courage to put it out there and her knowledge was based on her husband who was a colonel who was in charge of dirty tricks um, and a journal that she had photocopied and she presented the information to the Reverend Strawcutter and you know in that she goes into um, specifically the lifestyle of, of SEALs, and she does go into specifically the Navy SEAL, SEAL Team, I can't remember which one it was, but it was, uh, I think SEAL Team 6, um, and she, she speaks about uh, Eight. how, Muslim. sorry? Are we back? Uh, hold on one second, we're, we're working on that. <laughs> okay, interesting. yeah, interesting. now, um, still live, and uh, I don't think that it, it actually broke broke up on the live stream. It um, it just broke up on the Skype. So uh, sorry you were interrupted there, Eva. Um, That's all right. Uh, we're gonna continue this. I think what you know the trigger word was um, the NS, <laughs> the Navy SEAL. So let's go and try to continue with this. Go right ahead. So we okay. were saying SEAL so, Team 8, I believe. SEAL Team 8 was the trigger. Okay. So um, Kay Griggs talks about a SEAL Team in Virginia Beach, and um, she talks about the transgressions. And she, she, in her interview in 1998, this is, you know, it's been out there for a while, she talks about how, you know, they picked a girl in a bar, a beautiful young woman, I think she was a doctor, gang raped her and she was strangled to death and uh, in her documentary case speaks um, about uh, how nothing much came of that so um, you know to hear this you know well kept well to do socialite woman who's very educated speak passionately and fervently about what she believes is necessary to come forward um, as a patriot to share with everyone uh, it said that that was my primer for when I witnessed Bill's first interview. And um, thank God to her. Thank you, Kay, <laughs> for having the courage to come forward. Um, so, again, she, she validates the lifestyle transgressions and how they're used to keep um, you know, personnel in line and to ensure that they then are able to have clearance. She validates, um, you know, her husband having prior knowledge to 9-11, um, which would also coincide with uh, Bill's comments about this village that was um, then blown up. Um, we'll present some, some material, some evidence, and he will send you to some links that have evidence posted uh, as well. Um, 
Project Camelot is protected legally from um, from s certain uh, issues simply because of the way we've decided to to do this broadcast. So I just want people to to understand that we do not wish to be embroiled in um, sort of legal legalese and spend our time uh, defending a, a bunch of nonsense um, in court, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, that's just a waste of our energy. So, so we want to want to focus on the ball, so to speak, here in 2012, and we'd like to to move along. But with that said, uh, we do want Bill to bring forward as much evidence as he can muster and and direct your attention to that evidence in whatever way he sees fit during this broadcast. So, uh, Bill, at this point, uh, I I know that there are many many questions still in the audience and I am I'm getting you know a live stream chat we have uh, Tommy my webmaster who's going to be helping behind the scenes to gather up the questions uh, hopefully those questions will go into caps and also if um, if anyone can assist him to gather them onto one uh, Skype and then Tommy can Skype them over to me that that would be great because it, it becomes very difficult to watch the stream go by when we have so many uh, listeners, live listeners, as you can appreciate. Um, um, can, real quick, if I could ask, um, have you uh, put the link up on chat for the reference materials that I'm going to be uh, giving out to people? Okay, um, Tommy would have put that on the uh, on the page, which is at uh, projectcamelot.tv, but uh, I he will he's listening to this, and so I will ask him to do so. So, Tommy, if you could please. Uh, post that link into the chat for people. Um, I believe it's also been posted, I think, on the forums. So I believe it's on Avalon and Camelot forums for, for people that, uh, that, that would like to get to the evidence right away, but you will be able to see it after this broadcast as well. After this mm -hmm. broadcast, this will be continue to be live streamed as all our broadcasts are. Uh, it will also be downloaded and put up to YouTube as quickly as we can manage it, so be patient. Um, and it will continue to be free uh, to anyone and everyone. We are asking for donations. This is uh, takes a lot of time for us to get one of these things together. We have uh, people like our, my webmaster working behind the scenes. Um, he's using an old computer. We need to buy him a new one. Anyone who can help us uh, in these ways, we, we do appreciate it. Um, so at this point, I, I do want to say this broadcast was never in in um, uh, danger of being canceled in any way. That was a disinfo campaign. Uh, we tweeted in live and um, Facebooked immediately uh, to let people know that that was was a fake um, sort of attack on us. At this time, our servers are being attacked. So, pe um, so I'm going to ask people to be patient with Project Camelot TV. Uh, if you have friends that want to listen, they should be clicking on the direct live stream link to get here uh, if they're having trouble because they are attacking our servers in force at this time. And Tommy's, as always, doing an incredible job. Um, so thank you, Tommy. Uh, go right ahead, Bill. I would like you to, to, to move forward in the, in the direction you would like to at this moment. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I would like to uh, start off by talking about the uh, donations um, because I been, uh, well, I've had questions about the, uh, the $1 donation that I've been asking for. So uh, let me give you a little bit more information about that. Um, what that uh, has been doing is allowing me to uh, find the people throughout the world, I might add, um, that are interested in helping the people that want to do some good in the world, that are ready to stand up and do something about it. Um, so I wanted everybody to know that uh, I have had a very good time knowing just how many people are aware and awake and ready to stand up and do something to change the country. Uh, certainly where the donations are coming from is the most important aspect of this. Uh, all over the world, uh, 13 different countries in four different currencies so far. It has been truly amazing how many people have stood up and uh, wanted to do something. Um, what I'm going to do is so uh, people know who they are, 
uh, I am going to cut off kind of the list of donations after this broadcast. And so everybody that's donated this far, uh, whenever I talk about the captains of light, that's you guys. That's who has stepped up first. And since in Navy rank, uh, captains are probably the most uh, important officers in uh, the Navy. That's why I'm using that, and it makes it easy so, for me to talk. Everybody afterwards will be commanders of light. So um, what I want everybody to do, uh, since you're ready to do something, is uh, get that link that Tommy's putting up with all those reference materials, and you're going to find that uh, Senior Chief Don Shipley and the special investigator, uh, his title is Forensic Psychologi Psychological Investigative Criminologist. I don't know what that means, but it sounds really important. His name is Dennis uh, Chevalier. Um, and those two gentlemen um, need to hear everybody's voice and understand that we are ready to stand up for something good in this world. I don't want any negative. I don't want any attacks. I want you to send them your love and your light and to show them that there is more people out there than they could possibly imagine that are ready to do something for change. And hopefully that will be a nice little demonstration slash exercise of the ability that we do have to affect change if we stick together, if we work together, and if we show people as a group what's going on in this country. Because like David and I talked about in the last interview, we both see the changes. We both know what's going on and how people are changing their attitudes. And they're not going to accept fear anymore. They're not going to accept being bullied. And they're not going to accept uh, the propaganda that's put up against the people that are trying to do the most good in the world so as to disvalue the information and the truths that they're putting up. So if you guys could, uh, you know, be good captains of light and express that you want them to understand that there is support out there for what Carrie is doing, for what I'm doing, for what David is doing, for what Eva is doing, and that things need to change and that you are going to help with that change and no amount of disinformation that they put out will bring that, uh, will not make that happen. Um, okay, um, Bill, I just want to interrupt you here one second because a lot of people are curious uh, about Eva. Uh, obviously, she's a new name and a new face. Could you introduce her briefly anyway at this point? Uh, you know, I'd, I'd like to keep with whatever schedule. Uh, yes. protocols you'd like to have, but I do want you to at least give her some kind of introduction. Um, we will try to bring her on screen during the time when she's actively in, involved and, and try to focus on you when, when that's not happening. But uh, yes, if you could please give her background. Uh, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's, let, uh, let's bring her in right now because uh, I think she's got some important stuff to say to everybody and we'll just let that happen. Um, Everybody that uh, has seen my second interview with David and Carrie and Bill uh, knows Eva. Uh, they may not know it, but uh, uh, during the interview, I did kind of blurt out of nowhere about this uh, person that I was having this connection with during all the chaos that I was uh, going through to get to safety. And uh, I will, after Eva speaks, talk about uh, where I've gone and what I'm doing and the kind of support that I'm getting. Uh, but uh, I mentioned that there was this person that I had this special connection with that was, uh, you know, on my mind during the interview. Uh, I had only spoken to her. We had exchanged emails twice, um, and I was too busy to understand, you know, what was going on with this connection. Uh, but I think it would be nice to have... Eva explain kind of what was going on on her end during that part of the interview. Okay. Um, okay. Yep. Everybody, Carrie? Yeah, absolutely. Go okay. ahead. Okay. I can't hear you, Carrie. Is that normal? Oh, sorry. Uh, yes, I'm sorry. There we go. Uh, what I do is I everyone should mute themselves when the other person is talking. That way, we avoid a 
a looping uh, audio thing, but I'm sorry, I forgot uh, to un unmute myself. So yes, okay. absolutely, go right ahead. Okay, well, um, first of all, I wanna start by thanking you, Carrie, and um, I just see this as such an exciting time